Welcome, everybody, to a, a tiny bit delayed uh, Vegas Summer League uh, review number six. Um, we have uh, three people on today. Um, Jake, unfortunately, uh, is on East Coast time, and this didn't quite work. He will be added back onto another stream, uh, so we will get Sharif on another day. But what we do have is a, uh, a wonderful group of talking about a lot of different possibilities for wing creation. Um, and let's throw to our group now. Guys, how are you doing this evening? And uh, let the people know uh, where they can find you and where you're from. Uh, thank you, PD. I'm doing well. I am disembodied right now, so I apologize if that's thrown anyone, but I am Chucking Darts. I am at Chucking Darts on Twitter. I host a podcast that is the Chucking Darts NBA podcast. That's lots of uh, NBA and draft stuff alike, and uh, very excited to make my debut on on your excellent film series. So I'm doing well, man. Thank you so much for uh, for uh, joining me and, and sticking out a little bit of a delay. Um, yeah, appreciate it. I'm Bennett. Um, you can find me on Twitter at bendog28. Um, I've kind of st taken a step back a little bit from putting out as much published content about the draft, about prospects in general, but you can still find my stray thoughts there. Um, and then I had an article published in the DePaul Sports Law Journal about how COVID-19 and the player strike in the bubble could impact the labor relations. Um, so if you're interested in the minutia of the collective bargaining agreement or how the next CBA could look a lot different, then you can check that out at the DePaul Journal of Sports Law. It's very good. Uh, I haven't all the way finished it, but I am working my through it, my way through it. Uh, labor law and and its impacts on the next CBA is is something I find very fast fascinating. Oh, yeah, I appreciate that. Of course. Uh, and I am Tommy Gunn. You can find me on Twitter at tgun21. Um, yeah, just thank you, PD, for having me on. Really excited to talk Moody. Um, I thought he showed some uh, some really fun things during summer league, and I was surprised by a couple other things. So this should be fun. He's uh, he's one of my favorite prospects in in recent years, and I think you uh, you share that affinity, so it should be fun. Oh yeah, uh, this this may uh, turn into a pretend that the Warriors drafted Moody first. <laughs> that, that's uh, what I've been who's, doing all who's, summer. Who's to say? Um, I will not be getting. I mean, I could potentially be getting hate mail from my dad about this. Uh, as as longtime viewers know, uh, I, I grew up a a Warriors fan, and uh, I have been called a hater on multiple occasions for uh, some of my uh, opinions on who the Warriors have drafted, and I have been definitely called a hater for my approach to this draft cycle for the Warriors. Um, I am excited to give Warriors fans some some uh, overwhelming positivity and to talk about you know. Uh, a player who fits very much in the championship style mold. Um, but first up, we have uh, a player that I loved in last uh, year's cycle and one who came and played four extremely interesting summer league games, uh, and that's Jade McDaniels. Chuck, what are the uh, five areas that you're paying attention to most with, with Jaden? Uh, so in this game that we're about to you know review, finishing craft was by far and away the uh, area I was most interested in. You know, Jaden surprised me. I'll speak only for myself. Surprised me last year with how ready he was to contribute as a rookie, and most of that was on defense. You know, he I think he had largely positive returns as a rookie, even though he averaged you know less than seven points a game while having sort of 25 minutes a night by the end of the year. And this game that we're about to watch is the Wolves and the uh, 76ers. 76ers had a very fun summer league team, had, you know, guys who could check him in ISO situations and Aaron Henry and Jaden Springer. This was the game that Paul Reed had like 27 and 20. So um, I wanted to see how Jaden performed in that environment and mainly what his theory of, uh, on ball offensive ability was what did he do inside the arc? Uh, how did he get his looks? Were his looks easy? Um, and just how he was finishing number one is his finishing craft. How did he transfer from all of this ground that he covers so easily uh, in actually, you know, putting the ball in the hoop and Part and parcel with that is driving at different tempos, trying to set up his moves. What moves was he going to? Uh, you know, what what is his go-to theory? Um, absorbing contact point of attack on both sides of the ball, um, the offense and defense. You know, if you watch Jaden, you'll see 
just how different um, I mentioned it, but how different he moves relative to every other player. Uh, just so easy and uh, just has these galloping gazelle like strides, but he's built kind of skinnily. And so you wanted to see how well he could take contact, how well he could dish it out, how frequently he sought it when he was driving to the hoop in an effort to draw any fouls. Um, and then on defense, how uh, smartly he's able to gamble. When you have Jaden's gifts at 6'9", um, with his rim protection instincts and everything else, it is very... Uh, it should be the type of profile that allows him to frequently, you know, live in passing lanes and to make lots of smart gambles uh, to try to event create, as we say on defense, you know, getting deflections and everything like that. So I wanted to take a look at that and uh, then just any sort of patience in the pick and roll. I mean, he is not the most natural score. He doesn't look for his shot in the most natural way. And so I wanted to see what sort of development he has out of the pick and roll, looking to make plays for himself or others. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that, that you know, I, I generally think of um, Summer League as, as two pathways. You kind of have the guys who were defining their NBA role. They're doing the, precisely the thing that, that they're being asked to do. Then you have the guys who are exploring the studio space. And I think with, uh, with Jaden, he kind of spent this year doing, or this Summer League session, doing both. Where, like, he was mm -hmm. doing as much as he could, but... At the same time, like so much of what he does defensively is going to be present no matter what. Um, and that's that's a really rare thing to both be able to develop now and to develop later at the same time. Um, you know, Tommy knows this from watching the Warriors that like having two timelines is something that is possible to develop and possible for players to be involved in both. But it requires um, a pretty specific set of instructions for those younger guys. And the difference for Jaden in, in the Finch years was like, I feel like that was or the Finch half year was just that everything was so much cleaner. So I'm excited to see him, you know, after a, a, a summer, a, a little bit of time uh, to work on his game to see how he's internalized those lessons. Um, yeah, this is also, uh, do we have a quick review on the summer league uniforms of the Timberwolves? Uh, mixed <laughs> reviews from the stands. Um, <laughs> I'm keeping that to myself. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm not. I'm not going to throw any shade. I just about any, you know, any uniform that includes lime green that evokes the uh, the northern lights is going to be good by me for Minnesota. So, okay, I'm going to just. I'll, I'll say it. It looks like um, what you would get at a very athletic laser tag studio. Um, I love it. Let's go. All right. I feel like uh, we're going to get weird with it. You might as well do it in summer league. Yeah. I mean, they went a little wild. It, it happens. It's the time to get experimental. 100%. Um, that one may... Oh, yeah. Uh, I clipped a lot of these. I clipped the full possession um, uh, rather than getting just the uh, the one. Uh, this one may have been a small misfire uh, at a missed... Uh, yep, here we go. This is the possession we should start with. The, the grab and go on the other one. There we go. Yep. Yep, and this is, you know, he was not on ball that much in this game. And so anytime he was able to get out and show what makes him him, you know, on offense, which is most obviously in transition, I wanted to take a look. And that's Paul Reed with his, you know, amazing stat line he put up. And you see how easily, you know, Jaden can just get to a spot, force help and and find a cutter. Uh, that's something in summer league he did on more than one occasion when he was able to draw help and just it looks very nice there, very clean, very simple, winning very easily. And then on this ensuing possession, that's Jaden Springer. And again, you see the ground coverage, uh, you know, just putting him right where he wants to be on defense. And, you know, Reed was not matched up much with uh, McDaniels. He racked up those stats mostly uh, when he was with Nathan Knight. And so uh, I wanted to see who Jaden guarded. And it was mostly Springer, Isaiah Joe, who certainly had his moments in summer league. And he did not have much trouble staying in front of, you know, anybody in this game. It almost looked at times like, uh, you know, he knew that he could handle these guys and did so pretty easily. This is one of his, uh, again, another one of his on-ball possessions where uh, does PD's 
you know, favorite move, quick stutter rip, quick uh, first step right by Aaron Henry on the baseline. You see that first step, how he's able to uh, cover ground, get to his spot, and then stop and pop. He gets fouled on this play, but this is one of the moves that Let me run it back for you. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. No, no, I want to see it. I want to see. I just want to appreciate it again. I can't. I can't appreciate a good set of rip on my own show. Word. Wow, that's crazy. Um, Yeah, I I think that it's really important for him uh, just attacking quicker. That was a a problem for him um, at like lower levels. And I think through his college year was that he um, can look at the possession like and decide what he wants to do instead of just like instinctually hitting. Um, and so in, in a setting where he is exploring the studio space to still have the idea of trying to be a, you know, a 0.5 decision maker, um, is really important. I agree. And this is actually, um, in this game, at least really the only time I saw him, uh, go to that particular quick drive kind of move. He, there are some possessions later where they get him going downhill already, where the decision is sort of already made for him. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this one. Only movement three I saw him shoot in this game. Um, it, obviously, the result is not good. And I actually, PD, wanted your thoughts on how I, you thought his form looked. I thought he, you know, ar- arched his back a little bit yep. here. He doesn't take much of a, a jump forward with his legs, kind of scissors them out. Uh, looked like it needed some work, but I wanted to know your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, so, like, what it kind of looks like here is that he's, like, he's angled, his, like, his chest backwards. Um, mm-hmm. sort of like he's trying to shoot behind him. Like, obviously, we've picked a particularly uh, troubling screenshot, but, like, the you can see how the energy is moving upwards. He's going to, like, f- sort of try to tilt forward to overcompensate. Um, you know, what that says to me is that, like, the upper body is doing its work, the lower body is doing its work, and the energy transfer between the two is not present. You know, him having to tilt back to throw the ball forward, which, like, is something that wasn't necessarily present in his college tape. It's just that, like, as you add strength, the jumper switches a little bit. You have to re-smooth out. It's a... It's always a growing and then relearning process. And this seems to be, um, you know, the legs are still a little bit better uh, than, or the legs are better, a little bit better than they were previously, but we're still seeing a little bit of the scissoring and there's not as much uh, posterior chain. So like he doesn't squat into his jumpers. He shoots them kind of like off his toes, mm-hmm. um, which is going to be a power generation issue. Power generation plus, uh, plus energy transfer results in these sort of like weird, like, balancey like the things that like they don't look right but you can't explain why they don't look right here's like i don't know about that it's, it's usually when when somebody isn't using every part of their body and the other parts have to overcompensate specifically and the upper body thing i think he could probably stand to get that right foot forward just a little bit more he's probably mm-hmm. scissor kicking uh, because he's trying to compensate for that right side not being aligned immediately you know he's basically square to the hoop there if he gets that right side a little bit more forward that right shoulder that right hips automatically align with the hoop and instead of overcompensating and over rotating, he's just naturally aligned, and you don't get that that huge scissor motion. Motion yeah. like the only guys who can do that successfully are like Steph and Dame, and they don't count. Like yeah, if you're yeah, just you a regular shooter, you you can't do the scissor step at the end; it won't work. Yeah, uh, or or you're just a guy who like it just straight up does not matter how they shoot; like it's going to go in regardless. Um, right, and that's a touch thing. That's yeah. a natural touch thing. Yeah, it's like no matter how Duncan Robinson shoots a basketball, it's going to go. So like oh, no. at that point, we might as well just like take him out of the sample. Um, I think, again, I don't want to say it looks worse because it's clearly that he's reintegrating more strength and trying to make adjustments, but like, Mm -hmm. this is going to just be a continual, um, uh, pattern for him where he adds a little bit of strength or, or tweaks it a little bit, then it looks worse. He smooths it out, then he's going to tweak it a little bit and, you know, it's going to be continual moving upwards, but we've just hit a cycle where, you know, there's still some disconnect. There is a disconnect. Is that still a problem on his threes off the catch, or is that only off the dribble that we see that? Because if it's not off the catch, then I don't know how. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think that it gets exposed more the more power you need. So like, it look it's it's present on the catch, but it's not as visible on the catch. Like the symptoms are there. Um, it's sort of like you know when your lungs are bad from smoking and you like they're always there. It's just that when you have to run a half mile, that's when it's really obvious. Where you're like, oh yeah, no, I'm out of shape. Uh, I should probably you know readjust if this is what I want to do. It's sort of the same idea. Um, it's present when he shoots, catches and shoots. It's just not as under as much pressure. But in the you know the, the half mile idea, you know when you put it under extreme motion or having to shoot off the dribble, it gets exposed and you can see the you know the seams and, and where the issue is. 
Yeah, and from what I saw just in watching some of his other summer league tape, he looks a lot better when he can step in uh, to the jumper off the catch. And it actually kind of reminded me of um, sort of how Josh Giddy shot it uh, in the NBL this year. That's frequently when his shot would look the best as well, when he would step in and obviously no one was around him and conceding the jumper as well. But th- I think a big thing with Jaden is also just in his confidence shooting it. Um, he got up four threes in this game. He played a lot of minutes and one of them actually was a desperation three that sent the game to overtime. That was sort of the highlight, although I didn't, you know, include it as a clip because it was, I mean, it was a heave at the end of the game. Um, and he, he sort of faded in and out of offense in this one, um, for whatever reason. And so hopefully that volume picks up because it's not as though he's going to get all the on ball reps in the world in Minnesota with the other people they have on that team. Yeah, and not to belabor the point too much, but I think one of the tough things with a guy like Jaden, who had so much freedom in high school, is going from being able to shoot any shot he wants and essentially just finding a rhythm throughout the course of a game. And now he has to be way more selective with those looks. And he is more of a rhythm shooter, or he was at least. Mm-hmm. And now you can't do that. So you're you're really having to refine things that you never even thought about before. And that's the position he's going to be in for a while. Yeah. I mean, and, and getting out of being a rhythm shooter is... Uh, is is by repping the stuff clean and getting to a point where the normal, even like a little bit under stress, feels under rhythm. I mean, Tommy, you say not to belabor it. Like the point of this whole thing is to belabor so that people can pick up, you know, the little stuff we have. So like, hey, we we this is a, a labor a, a belaboring only space. I have been described as a pedant many times, so this is perfect for me. <laughs> what do you think the P and PD web stands for? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this uh, this play here was what I thought was his best sort of um, offensive flash in the game and certainly had a good result. But another grab and go where, uh, you know, he forces transition, he feels Reed, you know, coming. And so he slows up to be able to generate that little extra space so he can focus on attacking Henry one on one. This is sort of that changing at different tempos I listed at the beginning. And then he steps into him, doesn't seek um the foul much. He just does it mostly to be able to elevate and create the angle. And at six, nine, I mean, this is where the conversation really starts on Jaden. He is such, he has such a great frame and is so uh, athletic that he can get to angles. Other guys can't get to just by sort of playing, being a rhythm player, as Tommy said. So not the, you know, the best angle for this transition layup. You would have, I would have liked to see him try to Euro and really force contact, you know, in summer league, over four games, he only generated 10 free throws, which for a guy of his gifts, you know, you would hope would be a little bit more than two and a half a game. But still, you can see the the margin for error he gives himself on drives and the options he gives himself with his ability to finish. I mean, I still like this. Like, this is a veer finish where, you know, both steps are into a guy and then on the jump, you jump outwards. Um, right. Ideally, you want it to be a little bit more stabilized. He, you know, what he loses a bit of uh, a little bit of his balance and kind of topples over, but he's also doing this like versus Aaron Henry. who's like a very good humble. So he doesn't yeah. get, he also doesn't quite get the contact he wants on that second step. So he doesn't really have the ability to like bounce off and then stand still. He's kind of tilting over and then topples the other way. Um, uh, so I think that this is like, I would say good process. You just hate, you kind of don't like the release point and how fading it is. It's just getting that for him core stability the ability to to uh, handle some of his creative ideas with his like his 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 brain is capable of, of getting him to try moves that his like his body just can't balance. So this is a this is the appropriate move to me considering the circumstances. It's just that you see him lose balance a little bit here, and then he counter loses balance fading back on the move. Yeah, and I think that's what the really exciting thing about following Jaden is right now is because, um, you know, he's going to play big minutes because Minnesota needs him in that slot because of, you know, the weak side help he can give Towns. You know, he might start for them this year, but he's still growing into his body and still so young, you know, with all of these little gifts and flashes. So, yeah, and that's the thing, you know, Henry was on him for, he was, you know, a part of that stutter rip possession earlier and just really didn't bother Jaden. Like Jaden in this whole game was just sort of like, like, okay, you're here, you know, big deal, with the exception of really one or two drives in the fourth quarter that we'll get to.
And this is Reed, you know, coming right at him in transition, tries a little Euro and Jaden, you know, he did this last year uh, in his rookie season, just very easy for him to stay in front. Uh, great uh, ball skills and getting an, any sort of a deflection. Reed also doesn't choose to really bury the shoulder and force the issue physically. He sort of pulls up right there on the first part of his Euro, but uh, very good patience by McDaniels uh, and just can force a really bad look and allows, you know, forces Reed to slow up so that help can arrive and really make it a one-on-three scenario. Okay, so can you? Uh, I kind of think Jaden tries to pull the chair, but he might have just been knocked in such an awkward way that it looked graceful. Where are you guys at with this? Because I can see a case for him pulling the chair on the attempt for the shoulder to shoulder Euro, but it might just be that we have our, our angle being blocked a little bit. Um, yeah, he, he kind of pulls the chair. I think he does take a step back with that right foot, like he doesn't want to receive the contact mm -hmm. and then strips at the ball. Um, I think just the most exciting thing about him, obviously, has been all the defensive stuff. Like, And that's, you want to talk about problems with, with development, we can go to Washington and then playing a bunch of 2-3 zone, but like you didn't get to see any of this stuff in college. Right, yeah. or not a lot of it. Well, right? you, and this is transition, so it's different. But like, the offensive stuff was always kind of intriguing and exciting, but it was really raw. The defensive stuff is actually what's got him on the floor earlier, and, it, and it's going to allow him to explore more of the offensive side of the game, where he wouldn't have had that if the defense wasn't there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that like the the thing that uh, I think a lot of evaluators struggled with was that he flashed like these good, you know, close. He he flashed like the physical stuff you'd expect on defense, the ability to close space, the the. You know, good direction changing for a skinny guy with super high hips, um, good reads. But it's like, how much of this is him having no response or having like one responsibility? And, you know, what does that look like when he's churning three or four defensive reads? And it undersold how much feel he had on the defensive end. And a lot of people just chucked it up to like, oh, you know, it's his own. Um, but I think that there is a threshold where it's like, no, if you have really good feel, you don't just look good. You look awesome. So uh, I think with Batiste, it's the yeah. same thing with Batiste. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say is like, I feel like we're kind of underselling just the defensive median outcomes of like almost every Washington prospect the last five years because of that zone with Bible and even McDaniels. Like it doesn't really like, you don't see the instincts and the movement that's there, but like, it's not going to go away if they should. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or sorry, go ahead, PD. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, if you really want to follow that line of thought to its ultimate conclusion, I would love to introduce you with to 2022 prospect Kadari Richmond. Uh, who is truly awesome in, in a 2-3 zone and uh, has uh, transferred to Seton Hall and had some, um, I would say, Jaden McDaniels, Matisse Thibel better than what you would expect or even like a good prospect defensively with feel. Um, and that he may parlay that into a potential first round selection. So we may actually get a guy with two, co two college years under his belt where we can actually compare how he did as like the wing, you know, the top of the key wing uh, playmaker in, in that uh, Syracuse slash Washington uh, lineage two three and then a year as a man to man defender so uh, exciting data point for a uh, exciting prospect who i i really do uh, believe in all right we can oh, jump cool. back oh yeah i was just saying that i saw him a couple times this year do a similar thing where um he might have been pulling the chair there but he just he has so much faith in himself to be able to still make a play on the ball even if he's granting space as long as he is sort of in front of the ball as long as he can reach it and very few guys again have that sort of margin for error where they can recover in that way and he does which is really cool to watch yeah like right here this is the i mean like nobody else like that's a very hard gamble exactly and, yeah he he um consistently puts like big money on fairly low uh returns and wins like he's this is a, a tough if if this pass comes out you are betting on the idea that you can close out from uh, a flying jumping jack to this shooter who's in, you know, at the wing right off screen. There's a dude standing right, like one step off here. This is where the, the, the screen cut off is for, for viewers. You guys can see the whole thing. But um, he's betting he can close down about 16 feet from midair. And he ends up getting a little bit of a deflection and uh, is, is able to roughly get there in time uh, yeah, as they go yeah. ball to bounce. But, like, that is a gamble on your ability to close out and being like, no, I can got it. I got it. Don't worry about it. Uh, Iguodala I mean, if he was also really hard there, he, If he closes out hard there, he probably can test the shot. Like, he kind of just mm. lands and somehow bounds forward out of a full jump and then is there on the catch. He just doesn't fully close out. But oh, yeah. the guy's a good shooter. Like, he literally lands on his right foot and is instantly moving forward. That's... 
that's insane. Like, I, I don't even <laughs> see that. Like, yeah, what? Lands on his right foot and he's already going forward. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, exactly, yeah. man. Yeah, that's what I saw too. Is like he I, he just moves so differently, and by the time the pass gets there, I mean PD's right. He gets a little bit of deflection, but he's just like waiting for him. Like, okay, now you'll shoot, and I'll contest after you shoot, and it'll be fine. It, it's just wild. You do not see closeout ability like that. You just don't see like six nine, six ten dudes with like incredible angle flexibility. Like he has bulletproof angles. You can see it when he you know does crossovers. You can see it like in in the slinkiness of his handle. It's all because, like, if you zoom in on the ankle, it's doing uh, unnatural things for that size. Where if you, if you see, like, a normal 6'10", do a crossover, like, they might get somewhere. But, man, uh, it doesn't look like this. And just look at all the weight is on that right ankle. And he, from this position, a flat ankle, he's going to bound forward and go into a closeout. Uh, on, balance and, uh, on balance and fully aware of the direction he needs to go. Like, that's, that's awesome. And those are, like, when we talk about upside and potential... To me, that is as upside and potential. This little moment, uh, where this is also going to be a theme today, where we talk about upside not necessarily being doing cool dribble moves, but uh, that that little interaction between the, his ankle, the floor, and the ability to change direction is as much defensive upside as any six dribble combo leaning to a, a, a double clutched uh, finish with English could ever be. So, you know, this is one of the few times that uh, Reed gets into him physically, which was on that that little rotation there. And, uh, you know, took the contact, got sent back, but stayed vertical. And, you know, he's skinny. He's going to lose his fair share of battles in this area. But with his length, you know, still had time to, to stay vertical and contest. And that's one of the areas I really am looking forward to seeing him uh, develop in this year, which is, you know, in his spot, he's going to be at, you know, PD, you call the power forward position, the sin eater position where they got to deal with a lot of these kinds of rotations and sort of sop up a lot of the problems that modern NBA offenses present. One of which is big, strong wings who can do stuff, you know, at a much higher level than Paul Reed can right now. So it'll be crucial for him on the Wolves to be able to absorb that contact, stay in front and still contest. Um, and I thought that looked, you know, relatively encouraging. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would just love to watch Jaden McDaniels and Pat Williams play each other for like a seven game series. That would be my personal ner uh, basketball nirvana. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, like that's sort of like two guys presenting is the, the things that the other struggles with. Um, but he's certainly going to have to um, fill some unique spots on, on how this Timberwolves team is kind of built. Um, and not all of it is particularly comfortable for him. Like, I mean, I think passing uh, flashes and, and, you know, covering, being a more of a connector, not just defensively, but offensively, is going to be necessary. And uh, on that sort of point, you know, a lot of his work in this game when he got the ball was in trying to drive downhill, particularly in the second half here, as you see, uh, this is in the third quarter. And it's, it's something that he didn't really excel at in this game about transferring from his dribble moves to what he was going to try to finish with. Um, and you know, I mentioned that margin for error. This is another example of that. It's sort of he sort of wrong foots read and has this ridiculous adjustment in midair where he's just like, I'll just try this now. Um, and he can get down and get back up before anyone else and does it a second time and is able to finish. Just a wild athletic offensive prospect, but someone who is going to have to find some sort of craft in the lane when he's going downhill because his strength is not going to give him that many leverage points uh, this year. Yeah. Um, he's also a guy who like does have real physical concerns. Um, like this is a, this is a, you know, a chop action. So a, a down screen into um, a dribble handoff and Isaiah Joe bumps him off a spot. Like, yeah. Yeah. And not just off a spot. He bumps him over the screen and he's unable to turn the corner. If he turns this corner downhill, this is a left hand down. He's going to bang this on Paul Reed because even without that, he's able to turn the corner if he's lazy. Um, imagine what he would have done if he was strong enough and if he was core stable enough and had enough uh, explosion from his posterior chain to get all the way up. So, like, what well, what we're seeing, you know, is there is a huge amount of positive, but there's also like a huge, I would say, low hanging fruit as his body starts to get more balanced and starts to to develop in ways that I think that the NBA has historically been good at. This was sort of my argument for him pre draft is that a lot of his issues are things that the NBA has generally done well with. 
you know, like Brandon Ingram and uh, Cam Reddish added very large amounts of flexibility and they broadly have the same body. Um, and it's not just like, oh, flexibility in the way that like Jaden Springer needs it or uh, Josh Green needs it, but like, no, in, in the hamstrings, in the glutes and adding, you know, the, the small space explosion that will prevent people like Isaiah Joe from, again, bumping him off pick and roll spots with a head of steam, which is obviously somewhat concerning. Yeah, and it was a problem that sort of recurs here uh, in the second half. Not on this play, though. This was one of, again, one of his few pick and roll reps where he takes an extra, you know, retreat dribble and is able to find the next pass ahead uh, and deliver a pretty good, uh, just a pretty good simple roll pass. You know, the fact that he is as tall as he is is going to give him some edges in this area. He he showed a couple times in this game, you know, probably jumping unnecessarily when he passes or being a little quick to jump mm -hmm. past. But there was another possession earlier in this game where he picked up his dribble early and, you know, threw a turnover on a similar sort of action. And he avoids that here by showing just a little bit more patience. The other thing that stuck out to me about this possession is that, um, he never really looks like he's in any sort of a threat to pull up off the dribble to shoot. And, uh, Oh, I, yeah, sorry, that was, yeah, that other one where he delivered the pick and roll pass. But the, it's just another area of growth for him where just like it's, we say it frequently, but making the defense have to respect you out there to guard you. And if they don't believe that he is a threat to shoot the three when he's several feet behind the three point line, then obviously the windows won't be so wide for him to make easy passes here. Now, on this one, um, this was a fun little collision between him and Jaden Springer where Jaden sort of did what or pardon me Jaden Springer did what Jaden Springer does and Jaden McDaniels does what Jaden McDaniels does which yeah. is uh you know Springer makes the right rotation gets his hands right on the ball uh and because Springer is just so crazy he stays on balance and is able to finish uh on a play where that he really probably should have gotten stripped and lost the ball do we think that's a travel yes you think he walked there yeah yeah um, yeah that's a Okay, so my question is, do we believe he could run towards the top of the key and hit this three, running full speed? Just from a getting him, getting his legs underneath them perspective. Oh, right now, no, I don't believe so. Yeah, he's not there yet. No okay. way. How about this shot? Full speed into a 18-footer. I think you would have to take kind of like a... Like a Dame Poundsable almost. And, no, and I'm, like, talking, I'm talking plant and fire. Like right as oh, soon as he touches Okay. No way. I think I think he'd be all over the place. Yeah, I that is the specific shot that I am most interested in is zero step, like zero step uh, shots off movement, because I think that the percentages are going to be rough. But I also think it's really important for him to shoot them um, while they are bad, like while the, the wolves are still like developing. Um, I don't really think that the wolves are have a, a, a potential to be a playoff team this year um, because like this is on his roadmap to be really valuable. Because, like, what are you going to do if they run a Spanulis after this? Like, what if this first screener is Cat, and then once he's to the screen, he pops? Like, now you've, now you've asked a terrifying question of a defense of how they want to rotate. But it doesn't work if, if you're like, oh, yeah, just meet, the, uh, just meet the 6'10 skinny guy at the rim. That's not as terrifying because you can, you know, send one over and the other two help. Do we think he can actually get there, though? I mean, do you think that's, that's even possible for him? Because I don't know. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, like, I think that in the next two years, yes, but I just think that it can't just be that. The solution can't be like, oh, he finishes well enough at the rim. I think that it, for him and, and for his pathways, there's not really a, a way of him, like, finishing well enough that that alone does it. Like, this isn't an Isaac Cross situation where he's just like, if he gets to the rim, we're straight because he's going to get enough free throws. Um, I think that, like, he has to add some of that shooting versatility um, because it will also just create a huge variety of coverages, and those closeouts are also going to be something he feasts on. So if you're Finch, are you telling him to basically launch those this year? Like, what yeah. is... What, wait, so that's what it looks like? Because, yeah. I mean, that's tough. I, I mean, that's just tough in terms of where you're at with the team, because now if Jade McDaniels is shooting eight bad shots a game, what is Cat thinking? And yeah, you still I don't have, think it's eight. You still have Ant doing all of his developmental reps. Like, it just gets, it gets a little bit hairy quickly. Yeah, I mean, but I also, like, I trust bench a lot with the ability to balance these X and O's elements where, sure. um, you know, he clearly was able to install the perfect playbook for Ant quickly. And now you just yeah. layer like, okay, so after the, you know, the Ant, like what I consider like the jet sweep actions where it's like, 
you get Ant running towards the rim, and like the whole defense has to adjust. Now you add a down screen for the next action is a down, down screen for Jaden lifting. I don't think that that's hard to tack on. So that a defense now has to respond to two uh, high level movers attacking gravity that you know work against each other, and those will also give D'Lo more space to uh, do his little like floaters and and you know uh, second side pick and roll actions. I think that that is not just like I, I know it is. It sounds like a lot to say that this is essential element for them but like creating as many uh you know rotations for a like cat is always going to be fine it's getting d low easy shots using the gravity of others and the, and the worry of uh of downhill slashing knowing that it generally is going to lead to cat kickouts is going to be extremely important yeah I, it's interesting though i'm not so sure that they at least that they think that they are not a playoff team i mean they have the guys there to to sop up the offensive usage to the point where they think they should be winning games because they have enough guys who are good at enough things, at least on that side of the ball. That's what's interesting with Jaden is that I don't know how many actions you can really run for him. Well, you know, like Tommy was saying, uh, it's just sort of a lot of different masters to, to serve this year in Minnesota. And um, you know, this, this possession that we're seeing right now is sort of a, another mini example of how he he frequently doesn't quite have a plan when he drives. Um, now, I, I'm not really sure, you know, with where that uh, guy, man under the rim was, I don't know what his plan really was here to try to get around Reed, but as he gets cut off here, he it just, it's a very easy play for Springer to try to pick off. And just, yep. I don't even know if this was, it doesn't, it, it looked like this was him trying to improvise, but not really having a clear idea of how to do it. And that was sort of the theme I saw from him in this game in the second half. Uh, but I don't know what y'all saw. I saw a guy attacking a set defense who I don't think I want attacking a set defense. That yeah, person. I feel like we saw all this in college too. Like yeah. this is kind of, I think, why I ended up being too low on him. And like, I feel like a lot of the flaws that he had in college he still has not to say that he didn't improve, but like, it's not like there are a ton of areas where I was like, Oh, he's a lot better at that than I thought. I just feel like all of his strengths really, really translated. And he's just kind of a weird guy that works. It works out a lot of the time for him when it shouldn't. I don't know. All right. I'm going to run the, uh, the, one of the, I think this is the, the put back dunk. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, the, showed on the front end that was him staying in front of joe he gave joe isaiah joe problems on defense um all game long stayed in front of him very easily and allowed the man behind to poke it out um good you know simple but well executed hit ahead pass and transition and then you know just showed how explosive he is off one leg how easy he can make things look and this yeah. was sort of his most highlighty highlight so i thought it'd be a fun thing to include yep uh sorry jaden shouldn't have jumped Springer immediately runs out. I love that. I love the get out of the way. Don't even worry about it. Next play from, from Springer. There. That's a vet move. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. And I'm interested on y'all's thoughts on this one too. Um, kind of similar to that uh, one where he drove in and was cut off by Reed, but sees that he has an advantage to really get by Henry here with his first step. But I thought he picked up his dribble early and took off early. And that's what allowed for a rotation block that I think for McDaniels in this environment with his athletic advantage really shouldn't be um, running into, you know, this should be a pretty clean finish for him, but I don't know if y'all saw something different. Ben, you want to lead this one? Do you have anything that jumps out about this? Uh, here, play through it real quick. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of trying to think about McDaniels like almost in the macro now, because like, I feel like we're saying, oh, we don't want him attacking like set defenses because it's not the guy we want attacking set defenses. But then two plays ago, we're talking about how, well, we can't have him like kind of running off these like set screens either because he can't shoot off movement. So I'm just like starting to sit here like I feel like a pretty promising rookie year, but it's like I'm starting to question like almost where he fits in with the Wolves if they think they're a playoff team, if we're not gonna have him attack set defenses and we're not having him shoot off movement. Like is he just a spacer and a cleanup guy on offense and then his value is defense, which is fine. No, but 
I, I just think we've reached the point in in the campaign where you have to you know you have to choose your class and you have to develop in a certain direction. You know, uh, my my you know my my veteran D and D heads know at a certain point you got to pick you know uh, pick your struggle and like you were kind of at the point where like yes he's he clearly has a talent he clearly could play a couple of ways but like this team wants to make sense as soon as possible and that requires focusing his broader talents in a specific way. The thing that jumps out to me is that like digs do still bother him. Like his handle yep. is is better than it was, but like he is very concerned about spring right here. So like he gets Henry really bad on this Hezzy, um, which is funny because like Henry's like four inches shorter, just pops him out of a stance, and he, you know the fact that Jade McDaniel is getting lower than Aaron Henry is is pretty funny. But he can't get into the paint without you know worrying about Jade McDaniel's. And Henry is digging, and like those two digs, like they both get parts of the ball, but early pickup and doesn't immediately punish those two rotations. So that means that more digs are on the way. Um, I think that that's going to be like the block happens, like sure. But the, the real moment is that there's two and a half people on the ball and there's not an immediate penalty for sending that much out to him. To me, like it, it's that you either have to take another step. You have to, uh, you know, kick it back to four. You have to find a shake. Uh, the spacing on the weak side is not great. You know, we can see two players in uh, the, first hash mark and at the uh, the dunker spot, which is obviously not, not optimal. But the punishment of Diggs is, is no matter what avenue he picks, it's going to be something that he has to become um, very dig resistant um, or else teams are going to figure out a way of, of, of minimizing his close application because by sending stunts, by sending half digs or two hand digs, by you know, having uh, one double, one rotate over, there's, there's a lot of options you can throw at him if you believe that this is his susceptibility. Um, and you know that it does trouble his finishing. Because I think if there isn't this dig, he will find a different finish. But because the dig bothers him so much, he can't really load up. He can't really find a craft. And he just kind of has to fling it. I mean, yeah, he, he would probably oh, take yeah. more dribble, too. If his dribble were just a little tighter and the dig didn't bother him, he'd probably take one more dribble. And then you can finish off two feet. Or you can find an open guy if the spacing weren't so terrible on that play. But Yeah. I mean, I think there's a late Euro still there. Like, you know, stealing a step and then, and then stepping around. Yep. Um, so, yep. I mean, I feel like we've covered a bunch with, with Jaden in terms of discussion. Is there anything else that you guys feel like we haven't hit on anything in this particular summer league that jumped out to you, um, other than, other than the, uh, the Toy Story uniforms? <laughs> uh, yeah, nothing that we haven't, uh, touched on, but I think, you know, as, as we do, you know, in this series, you know, we're extrapolating a lot based on um, some of the stuff we're seeing here. But he, you know, this was probably his worst summer league performance out of all of his games. And some of the positive stuff that was there in other games, including one PD where he was matched up against Patrick Williams, yep. um, was him not necessarily off of movement elevating quickly, but off the dribble um, in the mid range, he can elevate very quickly and did show decent touch, maybe not the most, um, you know, repeatable mechanics ever, but again, my phrase I'm going to come back with is margin of error. He creates very large margins of error. Um, you know, that dig clip, notwithstanding because of his ability to separate, you know, both vertically and in a couple different vectors when he's attacking. So I, it's just, I want to see where his easy money comes comes from um, and how Finch decides, like you said, to sort of choose that battle and what direction he decides to push him in. Because I think there's ways to do it in a bunch of different directions. Just excited to see what that ends up being. Yeah, uh, I would say one of the most fascinating development cases in the league. Anybody else have uh, final thoughts on, on uh, Jaden? I was just because real quick because I feel like we talked a lot about his offense. Like I guess from watching more of his summer league than I did, and probably more from last year. Like, what do you guys see as his defensive upside, though? Uh, cleanup guy who is comfortable on like some scram switches, and uh, you feel good about really attacking. The, like you can put him on the third best wing on the floor and like attack their handle and attack the, like make them uncomfortable to try to bog down offenses. Um, to probably for to try to pull uh, as much usage as possible into stars, that would generally be the defensive philosophy I would have with him. Is that like offenses don't work, you you know, force a star to carry huge uh, as much burden as possible, and then once you have shut down the the third wing, you would start overloading at the star and, and making them see more bodies. Yeah, I mean, I think it could. I, I 
could look a lot like maybe Toronto UC Yakum when they were really good. Um, similar to that on that end. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think he's pretty special on that end. But um, overall, I think that last clip is is really instructive on where he's at offensively. Like, he gets Aaron Henry with the Hezzy. Like, the handle is really good. But then because of the handle, worry, or like, the Hezzy was really good. But then because he doesn't trust his handle, he's worried about Springer's dig. And he can't get more into Henry's body because he doesn't trust his strength. And then he has no avenue to slow down on the last two steps and maybe do that mini Euro to the inside, like you were saying, PD, or go through the big at the rim and finish. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm all in on the defense, obviously, but the offense is like, there has to be a path chosen and, mm-hmm. and it's going to be interesting to see what Minnesota does because like we said, it could go a couple different ways. Yeah. Uh, again, a uh, fascinating, uh, uh, I think that we often think of like the, the guys who get in lottery picks is like automatically the most interesting developmental prospects. And like, I don't find it to be like that interesting of a development theory like he's just going to get good at some like either he's going to get better at some of the stuff or not um but it's guys that i, I would say are lower down the both institutional investment and uh, uh like the clarity spectrum that i find to be the most interesting um and and Jaden is uh about as fun as they come in in that area and depending on what the timeline looks like depending on you know how these lineups are seen depending on how available certain guys on the team are for trade like i could see this going a whole bunch of uh ways and like also if, if they started to lose games like boy would i be calling to try to get this dude if i was a uh if i was on an eastern conference team like hi uh, uh who does cat like in the league uh can do we have any of his friends like how can we help you uh, we would like a Jaden mcdaniels please uh, okay um we're good moving on awesome um let's get into from one uh very fun at times confusing defender to uh, Najee Marshall, uh, a guy who I love, uh, I independently love, and, and uh, am very excited to make this one. Uh, yes, this is the Najee game. Let me just find a moment. Unfortunately, there's not timestamps within this. Okay, we're still at Najee. Oh, yeah, it is in order. That's beautiful. Back into the building. There we go. Okay. What are the five most important things, or five areas of attention you want to pay for, or pay attention to with Najee Marshall? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting because I feel like Najee, like pre-draft, I feel like a lot of people on draft Twitter and whatnot were pretty high on him because they saw a guy who was, like, pretty good at everything, but then if the shooting was this big question mark and if the shooting came around, then he could be like kind of a, an obvious like three and D archetype, but with some extra ancillary skills, primarily from just kind of secondary playmaking. Um, and summer league is kind of where that's kind of the place for him to possibly show that. Um, so I wanted to see just kind of what the impact of his secondary playmaking was. Cause there, as much as he, there are just not that many guys that are his size that I think have his, just kind of repertoire of different passing just from actually hitting skips to hitting pocket passes out of pick and roll. Like he is a pretty good playmaker, even though he didn't have the highest usage as a rookie or anything. So I want to see if there was more of that um, during summer league. I think that one of the biggest selling points of him out of college, probably the biggest selling point was just his uh, defensive versatility. Um, I really liked watching him a lot, which is uh, weird because he was playing for Xavier actually while I went to UC for undergrad. So um, but he killed us and every, every time we played them, um, and there would just be games where he would be guarding Marcus Howard all game and doing a pretty good job of it. And then a week later, he'd be guarding Eric Pascal. And then a week after that, probably playing better defense against Miles Powell than anyone else in the country. And so if you have a guy that can switch one through three like that at that size, especially playing by Zion and Brandon Ingram, who just don't really play much defense. Like I think that defensive versatility on ball can be, more helpful to the Pelicans than it would be if he were elsewhere. Um, I think that him pairing him pairing with uh, Kira Lewis is definitely really interesting, mainly in terms of transition. Um, I saw them pretty quickly out in the first game they played, pushing in transition more than I expected. And I thought with Lonzo leaving, if Kira and Najee and Josh Hart just push with Zion in transition, that could get, I think, the Pelicans just offense better off than otherwise. Um, the weird, I think the weirdest thing about him is that in 
college at Xavier, he was really, really good at scoring inside the arc. I mean, he was over 90th percentile in synergy, both at attacking closeouts and just um, shooting at the rim in half court. And that just kind of completely fell off, which is weird because the outside shot really kind of came on. I mean, he shot under 30% from three in college, and then he shot 35% as a rookie, 40% in summer league on small sample. But then all the scoring inside the arc kind of went away. He's still drawing fouls, but he shot 52% from two in college, only 42% as a rookie and under 40% in summer league. And um, I think a lot of that might just be trying to kind of figure out his craft, just maybe bullying smaller guys in a mediocre conference in college. Um, but I think there are definitely kind of just kind of feel things or flexibility things he can do and pulling into floaters, pulling into jumpers um, that like there are flashes that's there, but he's just not consistently scoring inside the arc. And like, that's probably what he needs to do in order to be a plus on offense instead of just kind of an average player. Um, and then I'll, I, don't, I always feel this way about some wings with summer league though, is like when the second or third year wings come back in summer league, I'm always just like first instinct is like, Oh, they look bigger than I remember. And I don't know how much of that is a college guy getting NBA training for a year and how much of that is a guy playing against summer league uh, teenagers and 20 year olds instead of grown mm-hmm. men um, and how much it was like an illusion or not. But I want to see if he's actually gotten bigger. So, yeah, I, I always try to like price it <laughs> the whatever years of like professional strength and conditioning. Like, you know, some college programs are obviously fantastic, but you just can't separate you know, the, the, the investment that you can make in your body once you're a professional. Just like, Pros just look different almost always. And you're, it is, it can be very jarring to go from, from younger guys to be like, oh, they, yeah, that's what a, a guy who's been in the league for two years like just looks like. And uh, it's also hard to grade in summer league because, like, on one, like, you kind of have to murder the, the smaller guys. If you, but yeah. like, is it like every single possession? Is like every single possession is like Zion level? Probably not going to happen. What about like, 80th percentile is that fine is that too low is that too like this is the thing about strength gains when you're you know uh, going against inferior competition is it's really hard to grade the difference between like a very good outcome uh, uh, or gradations on very good outcomes um so a lot of times you have to lean into the other stuff and you know the strength just being an add-on rather than being the main draw because so few people in the league win with just strength purely um especially at a at a wing position um yeah not to take anything away from you know Kyle Lowry. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the first two uh, on the copy I had are a little like they, they flash a little bit. Um, just a just a heads up, uh, that there's some yeah. frames missing, but the 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 stuff itself is fine. Okay, so let me see this one. Um, I believe it is a uh, there is a missed free throw, and then uh, and then he takes a hard close out. Oh, yeah, yeah. So kind of the interesting thing that we were talking about with Najee is like as much as he is super versatile defensively, he still kind of has problems with off-ball defense. And um, so this just kind of, it's going in chronological order of the clips I picked. So we're kind of starting out with the bad moment of just a pretty bad close out here because um, he can guard point guards through wings. But I think that his movement um, off closeouts and just kind of off-ball in general, this is not his only bad closeout of the game. It's the only one I picked. Um, and he had some other pretty bad closeouts in other parts of summer league. And, you know, no one's going to be perfect with closeouts, but I think that for someone who kind of his linchpin as a prospect was defense, um, I think that he has more maybe than a 23 year old who's um, in summer league maybe should have. And so I just want to see if maybe I was just had a couple bad, like he, maybe it's just a variance thing, or if you guys actually think that's a weak spot of his game. So I do think that it's a weak spot, but I also think that it could sort of position lock him a little bit where you'd want him to guard more ball handlers because there's just less closeouts. Um, yeah. And like one, it, 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 obviously like guarding wings is just more valuable because there's more combinations you can guard and you know it's easier to get you onto the floor. Um, but against ball handlers, those strength gains probably matter more because the average guard is smaller. So, I mean, in a way it could be more effective because it puts him onto like a place where he has a true advantage. But as we're going to see, like that depends on how much uh, he can rein in the events creation and like get all as much good out of uh, being a chaotic on ball defender uh, as possible without any of, of the negatives. But I don't want to step on your toes and get too far into uh, the yeah, we'll the, see those later for sure. <laughs> the martial experience. I know. <laughs> So yeah, speaking of a kind of actually similar defense you're talking about right here, um, and we talked earlier about how 
sometimes he's so intense on ball when he's guarding guards that it almost comes off as like a fake hustle that might not be real. But one area where I think it actually does kind of translate into impact, and you might disagree, is just his screen navigation, particularly at his size. Like right here, the way he kind of flips his hips to get around, force it back, and then man makes a good move and gets by him, but he keeps fighting. And with that combination of just effort and length, gets back in front of it. And I mean, they score here, but I'll be honest, like I actually kind of think Lewis takes a bad gamble yeah. and gives up the layup. Yeah, um, Kyra, I think Kyra, that's 100% yeah. on Kyra, yeah. Yeah, it's 100% yeah. I think Marshall played that about as well as he possibly could. And I think that's, if you watch the whole game, I mean, he caused problems for Trey Mann so much more than everybody else. Every other defender they put on, they try to put on him. Um, Man still got his sometimes, but I think this is a good example of Marshall, his actual, the kind of effort that, and his length actually having an impact and not being overblown, even though in other situations it could be. Yeah, I think that what we're trying to delineate here is is the difference between like meaningful disruptive defense that like breaks off again. Like they wanted to run this middle pick and roll. I believe there is another action paired Pat, once you get past the pick and roll that the, the wing is going to lift and they're going to run like a DHO or, or flow into something. And Najee just, you know, breaks that off. And now we're into a middle pick and roll, uh, which I do not think is planned just by looking at the reactions to the players on the floor. And what we're trying to delineate the difference between true disruptive defense and an idea I've come to label as 2K defense, where you just hold turbo and hit X and just like try to make stuff happen. Like it's... It's not like, I, I say that somewhat tug in cheek, but it's the idea of like events create, events create, and it's not like I'm pushing towards the scheme, I'm trying to push away from here. It's not as like sculpted as like, okay, they want to run an action over here, I'm going to fight over the screen to push them middle, knowing that there's not a counter, you know, and then I'm going to chase. Like, this is a perfect example of like disruptive from a team sense point of attack. There are going to definitely be elements of, of TK, and like finding that barrier and the exact guys that he can get the most value out of that is going to be a a fascinating um, decision for how, like how New Orleans wants to deploy them and on which guards, um, because I think there are certainly guards where like, this is very effective, not just like Trey Mann being a rookie, um, but yeah. the to style go, of player. Yeah, to go like really extreme with it, it's essentially the difference between like true as an on-ball defender or Westbrook as an on-ball defender, yeah. right? Like, like one guy is playing towards the scheme and he's like. He's chasing you up and getting over screens because he knows it's taking you out of what you want to do. Russ is just flying around and causing chaos. And at his peak, it kind of worked at times. Oh, he was I so mean, especially at UCLA as well. Like UCLA was obviously oh, yeah. more sculpted. Like UCLA yeah, was closer to for how long. Yeah. But even the yeah. first couple of years. Like, but as as the usage got higher, he got less concerned. I would say, just uh, speaking broadly, um, there was less of an attention paid to the, like, minutia of it and it was more just like the idea which is you know, that's the difference is like 2k defense is the idea of doing this like you it can work out well especially when you are uh, like older brothering somebody if there's a talent differential it works quite often um but you know legitimately disruptive is always rooted like drew is always pushing people to their weakest point trying to make sure that you are like putting as much pressure on their specific weakness as possible and 2k is putting pressure on and, and yeah, that, they're going that is three months coach speak. It's like act, activity without achievement is yeah. essentially what like Russ does, right? It, 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 in the long term, it hurts you. Eventually, it does. You know, and deep in the playoffs, that'll always hurt you. Hmm. Hmm. So yeah, this play, I thought it was like to me when I saw this, I was like, oh, this is like the stuff that I would occasionally see at Xavier, just because they had not much offense to go around them. And it was really just Najee and Paul Scruggs trying to create it always. And I felt like he kind of worked it out for the most part his rookie year, even though his scoring inside the arc was still pretty disappointing. But like, this is the kind of thing, like if he had to score, if he, when he has to score in the half court, sometimes he, his shot selection is not super good and he doesn't really have the burst to get by guys. And he loses his balance once he does actually make a move and get by somebody. So this was kind of a, like, and I, I also noticed when I was watching, like, almost every Pelican Summer League game, he seemed to kind of always get off to a slow start. I don't know if that is just a variance thing. It was just kind of bad luck. But there were, like, I feel like two of my first three or three of my first four clips are negatives, and then he got a lot better as the game went on. And that's how I felt about him in the Bulls game. And that's how I felt about him, about him in the Warriors game. So that might just be a weird thing. But, um yeah, on the first clip, I feel like he's driving middle and just can't beat his guy. And it's not like he's really pressured from the shot clock and he still um, just kind of takes a bad shot. And then here he's got a nice in and out and he kind of gets by and goes, but then he loses his balance and it becomes a bad turnover. 
Yeah, I mean, it's um, like this. I, I like this. I was like, oh, you know, we get a good and, and then, you know, we get a, a, a rough possession. And then the next offensive possession, you know, in and out gets downhill and then just loses the foot. And I was like, oh, OK. Um, yeah, like we were the process was good. And then just the foot slides out, um, which is, you know, obviously uh, not ideal. And Ben, when you said about how he would get better as these games would go on, get more in rhythm, get a bit more comfortable, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be interested in what y'all say that uh, that's pretty common for summer league. You know, Najee is not going to be a, the primary on ball guy for the Pelicans, obviously. And even among the guys on the floor, you would assume that Kyra would be that guy more so than him. So if in that first clip where he, you know, kicks it out a little bit early instead of taking another hard dribble and trying to attack um that low defender two on one, that could just be him trying to figure out, well, how deferential should I be? How aggressive should I be? You know, that sort of thing. That makes sense. Yeah. And this clip I think upcoming here kind of plays more into his strengths and like when he actually creates advantages. And this was something he does really well um, also off the pass, but kind of, I think his pace, his pace and just his kind of rhythm off of pick and roll is not, it is at, he's able to kind of like find angles and create an advantage and find passes when he's going pretty slowly, or he changes from slow to quick going laterally, I think better than most wings do. And I think he's. I think it, uh, he often kind of misleads the big with where he's going and gets him to either commit to him and do a drop off pass at the last second, or here in the opposite. I think he's going at a pace and with his eyes clearly. I think the big is really really worried about the role and he's able to finish. Um, and I think that's just it's it's a better place to put him in is when he can do this versus like okay you've got a guy in front of you just attack and try to blow by or use your strength to get over him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he he's he's just has a lot of like unexpected funk and having a longer wingspan really helps like he's a i mean he's a stronger dude so like obviously stopping is going to be easy like for dudes who are kind of built like coke cans like stopping like you just generally find them to be more like better decel athletes you know harden luca um uh, uh mason jones uh shout out to my boy um uh you kind of get you know these decel things and when you add that with wingspan like even if you don't have the the best handle if you can just decel and and create like finishing angles you can generally do really well because the most guys that defend uh like sort of like secondary or tertiary or you know uh just pure defensive wings are not built like this and so there's a inherent advantage if you can run a little bit of pick and roll to carve out these angles and i think that like we've kind of seen consistently the it's not, you know, the Eric Gordon level, but it's a, like, you know, a smaller scale version of Eric Gordon. Where it's like, there's just not the type of guy who you can physically match up. It's just rarely put on him. Yeah. Yeah. It, one of the main reasons that he was able to stick and get his minutes last year as well is because he, you know, not the best shooter, even though he had some good shooting numbers last year. And he just knows what he's good at when he tries to drive. He knows, you know. It, it's a rhythm sort of thing about him reading the big and knowing when to speed up and slow down. But if you have that in your bag, then you can survive not being the best catch and shoot guy, even when, you know, that rotation comes to you because there's more you can go to. That being said, when he does get put into explosive situations, it doesn't necessarily go great for him. Like he, he doesn't kind of need that bunk to, to create easy buckets. Is that a you guys feel like that's a fair representation of like in a straight line? It's much easier to time out because he just doesn't have like that real elite like stride length or there's not necessarily like a hook where he he does better in the smaller spaces where he can just find a little bit of space, uh, you know, carve it out with, with strength and and this combination of strength and length. I definitely agree. I guess like for me, I'm I'm trying to think. I didn't think the drop off from college to his rookie year would be that stark in terms of how kind of like how how he just, how much he struggles on these drives, like with this getting blocked here, like obviously, you know, Xavier's not the best competition. He was an older prospect and it was going to adjust, but I feel like, I don't know. I feel like I'm not, I'm not sure if there's low hanging fruit, but like, I still, I feel like he was better than he showed in his rookie year in terms of scoring inside the arc, but I, that might be just me wishful thinking. I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, I think specifically on that last clip, just in the micro sense, like use that D cell there when you get by JRE, you know, mm -hmm. like slow down, put your butt on him and then extend out towards the hoop or at least make a secondary decision there. Like he gets by him really easily. That in and out's like a nice move. You just got to slow down a little bit there and use his strength to his advantage and kind of take the shot blockers momentum away because he just lets him time it out and then he pins it right off the glass. 
Yeah, I, I actually think that he needs to get thunk here. I, I do think that, like, that is the solution. Instead of, like, trying to be... Like, he finishes that like he's Che Gildas Alexander. Like, that's that's the approach style. And it's like, nah, dog. Like, get real. Like, slow all the way down. Like, you shouldn't have... Like, ideally, unless it's, like, a, a breakaway dunk, I would love all of his finishes to be at a, as low of a miles per hour as possible. Slow yeah. him all the way down. Work on the little, like, Luca... Like, gives everybody shoulder... Uh, shoulder, chest, and uh, elbow, and then take like that, like two foot fadeaway that Luca loves. Like again, just decel as much as possible. Give somebody uh, a good bruise uh, right below the uh, right below the like third rib, and then lay the ball up every single time. He's strong enough to do it. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And he certainly has the balance skills. That's all right. Ooh. Oh, yeah, so this is just kind of the opposite. I think I had to do this one, but just kind of the opposite of what PD was saying earlier about, oh, um, upside is not always about a nice dribble move to a dunk attempt, like, in the half court. Like, I saw this, and I still have to include it, because sometimes it is. And oh, yeah. um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Trey Man, uh, Trey Man did not know where, where this was. Yeah, I know, I know. And, um, I, I just remember when this happened. Uh, even though he had, I mean, that is the kind of thing oh, that I think. Is that Trey Man? No, it's Brian Bowen, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Because 44 does not seem like a Trey Man number. Yeah, it's Brian. No, no, no. He's yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I, I do think Najee's handle was, I think it was somewhat underrated for him as a prospect going into the draft. And then I think it also got better from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think he's, I don't think he's got the type of handle to where like you want him running your offense or anything like that. But I think in terms of what I think a lot of times with these like three and D guys, it becomes just, they get so archetyped into like what they're going to do. And that's kind of dominates the conversation about them. And I think when someone has, I think like Najee has just slightly better ancillary skills, one with his intersection of passing for his size. And I think a better handle that he shows here. I think like there are avenues for him to be more than just a neutral on offense, but uh, absolutely. Um, I think that there are those pathways, but it's going to be giving, crafting out the exact, like crafting out as much of his, um, from a, from an X's and O's standpoint, setting up as much of his offense to leverage the stuff that we've talked about and to move him away from his areas of weakness. I mean, somewhat similar to, to Jade McDaniels, like everybody that we're talking about today kind of has to have as much of their offense scripted as possible in terms of like limiting the number of outcomes that could happen. You don't, I'm not saying like put them all the way in a box. But that, like, there's never going to have to be a time where they have to make 13 different decisions. It's like, okay, here's the three pathways. If the defense does this, you do that. And we will build counters out of all of those. So it looks like a lot more options, but really we're just picking, you know, we're making the defender make a choice and we're punishing them. So three options, but maybe a couple counters within those options. That stuff is going to be really valuable. But, like, if you give him, you know, 17 different pathways to creation, like, he's not going to do particularly well because he's best suited to, to a smaller number in a really specific style. Yeah. So here he does fine, kind of, kind of standing his ground and not fouling in transition. Um, and then that skip past the corner. He hits those pretty often. And there was this is actually one of the only games in Summer League. I think it's the only game where he actually did have more turnovers and assists. Um, there was actually a game he had, I think it was against the Wolves, I'm not sure, where he had 10 assists, only one turnover. Um, but he also only scored like three points in that game. Um, but the skip pass and transition that he hits, I think, is just part of kind of his – Something about his just his bag and passing that I think not a lot of guys his size have. Yeah, and certainly his um not I, I don't think it's just his size, but like a lot of the guys who are his general uh, uh usage style don't pass like this. Yeah. It's just Definitely. like you get guys who pass like this, they're not, you know, built like, you know, uh like robbers uh on a football field. Um <laughs> yeah. and the guys who are built like robbers, like you don't really generally want them to make live dribble skip passes overhead cross court. This is not yeah. generally not a fun intersection. And that's also what makes Najee such an interesting prospect. It's like, wow, yeah, yeah. you could really have some fun with this kind of uh, intersection. And what stands out on that pass, if we just want to stop it real quick, is not only like the recognition, it's the actual placement and the timing and like the accuracy like that. That's basically right on target. It's a little bit high and left but he gives the shooter enough time off of a live dribble skip pass to actually get the shot off. And maybe he doesn't have enough time if that's a real NBA game, 
um, with real NBA defenders, but still like for a guy that that is his type of usage, like you said, that's pretty impressive stuff just all around. Yeah, that's I mean, this is a, a strict value add pass where it's like, OK, so if the defense is in rotation, it's not just a one more like he can pick out a, another layer on a one more. And like those are value adds for his role. And also like a, a good counter if teams start to sag, you know that he can pick out an extra read. Like a lot of times, if you're a, a rudimentary passer and you have a bad shooting night, um, that I, I think like Andrew Wiggins is a good point of this. Like he doesn't make that second read on bad shooting nights. He still wants to yep. swing it to the first guy. And this is at least some buffer. It's not. I'm not saying that you don't have to be able to shoot, but this is some buffer. Like I mean, Draymond, another example. Um, but Draymond obviously. Kid Wadala. This yeah. is what kept, kept Iguodala valuable for years after he was basically washed offensively, besides the occasional throwback night like yep. he would he just picked out those reads all the time every single time he'd pick these out yep. and it's also worth remembering like i think because xavier usually has good shooters like it just kind of became a reputation thing but his last year at xavier which was his highest usage they had such bad shooting around him um, i think they were in like the bottom 50 in the country um in three-point shooting that year so getting good nba shooting around him is going to help him a little bit uh i have some Distressing news about the New Orleans Pelicans. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I like I like the ability to reconnect here. He doesn't get all the way back to the corner, but like you know, he gets close enough to challenge, and he, that's that's very skinny. Like he gets very skinny and battles back without any kind of real like foul potential because he's trying to time it up at the high yeah. point. Is that Bowen again? It looks like that was 44, yeah? Yeah, that was Bowen. So do you think that this, that reconnection is, like, how much less effective is it against an NBA starter if he's getting NBA minutes? I think that, the, I think that that's less effective, or, or I think that it's about as effective. I think that this contest only works on Bowen. Like, you're not getting okay. this versus a, a guy who knows what he's doing because he's already finished it. Like, Bowen's, Bowen is a, a guy who struggles to get, like, locomotion. Like, you do this to Jalen Johnson, for example. Like, Jalen Johnson has already punched it because his last two steps are so violent. Um, so I think that his attempt to, like, uh, to get a corner, then lose it to try to, like, just throw this into, like, the 19th row is the thing that would not translate. But I think the reconnection is still viable because he's still walking the guy out. And he you generally want to put uh, Najee on smaller guys where the strength level is still going to translate. So... I would say for most of assignments, obviously, like he's not, you know, going to move Drew Holiday off these spots, um, and he's certainly not going to meet, um, you know, the the upper tier like combo forward athletes uh, at the top if it, uh, if he's behind a step. But I think that there's, I see him as a guard defender, like not one to one what Alonzo did, but like that you can use him in on the similar types of of guys that that you want that Alonzo got thrown at. Does anybody have any disagreements with that? No, not really. I do wonder where his, how he gets his minutes there since they have Devonte and Nikhil, who I know they want to give a ton of minutes to. Um, Cause you would think, you know, obviously there's always going to be more minutes available on the wing, but if you see him as more of a guard defender and more sort of, as just sort of a bigger guard player overall, you wonder how he's going to get on the court. I mean, I think that by the end of the season, people, I, my bet, is that by the end of the season they view Nikhil as a wing and him as a guard? Um, at least if, if we're talking about who they guard, um, mm -hmm. I, I would much rather have him on ball and Nikhil uh, off ball to work on on the defensive field and and you know trying to maximize the tools he has in big space versus trying to have him do POA stuff, um, which I'm not really in love with. Um, you could obviously invert that on offense, but just thinking in terms of you know building lineups and 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 what types of guys are the hardest for them to like guard that that makes the most sense to me. Um, also, like you know Josh Hart is is like a guy that I think we've never seen in in a really big role like where you're, you're building a defensive theory around him, and I'm not sure if we can just pencil that in a hundred. Yeah, I, I get. Didn't they get a? Sadoransky and Temple as well when they shipped out lines. I mean, they just got a lot of yeah, but like Sadoransky, quantity. Every we yeah. do this every time with Sadoransky. Every every fan base is like he does all these things really well. He's athletic, you know. He he shoots on small volume and just like there hasn't been a coach who's like seen it the same way the fan base has every single time. And like maybe this is the time the light turns on and like you know there's a, there's a real click. But like 
I've, I've fallen for the Sadoransky cycle twice. I will not fall again. Or I, like, I believe that the corner has turned, that it was the previous administration. Um, like, yeah, in theory, he's the exact, him and Josh are, in theory, are exactly what you would want, but we haven't seen that ascension to, to you know, consume those minutes, even though they've been given, I would say, good chances multiple times. Is that is that too harsh about those two? I don't know. I was just looking for y'all's opinion. Not too harsh, in my opinion. I'm always rooting for Sato, but yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, all right, let me run this. Uh, I, I think it's the uh, the the replay of the uh, attempt to to ten throw this. Yeah. Yeah. So then here, yeah, here, here he steps into the three. Um, which the other thing with him at Xavier was he attempted like a really kind of high percentage of his three point attempts from NBA range, um, which might have contributed to the low uh, three point percentage he had. But I just think with this being his biggest question mark, and if you're if he's going to be playing minutes around Zion and Ingram, then shooting 29% in college to 35% as a rookie to 40% in summer league, even though it's on small sample off the catch. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of the narrative around him was like, if the shot is not decent, then all the other stuff doesn't really matter. And I think that the shots been pretty promising and that might be in all honesty, as much as we can talk about everything else, it might be the most important thing to the last 12 months of this play. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's just like, there are a lot of, for me, I try not to go with if he shoots because, uh, then I'm not, you know, then people don't need me at all. You know, yeah, so many right. guys are if he shoots and uh, I would lose a job. So I have to, I have to <laughs> pretend that there's, you know, these are all these extremely complex players who it's, it's not just that, but like, yes, if, if he shoots, like it, it does change everything. Um, do you think the improvement is real then for him? Like, do you think going from 29% college to 35% rookie is sustainable? Or do you think he's going to be low thirties, like for the next I mean, few years? I think that he's like a 30, three 34 guy for the next couple like i don't think it's like low 30s i think it's gonna be mid 30s but never like i don't think it'll be 36 this year i mean if if he um if he does uh if he does it i'd be thrilled but like to me this yeah. this looks more like a guy who's almost over the line but still has some stuff to do uh yeah still, still little cleanups um yeah I mean, there's, there's just so much going on there with that yeah. shot. Like the load up is forever. Um, and I just don't think he's really going to ever have any shooting gravity. Obviously making shots helps. Like if he's shooting 36%, that's great. But if it's taking that long to get off, nobody's really going to worry about him on the perimeter per se. Like you're not, you're not guarding him. You're still packing the lane for, for Zion and Ingram's whatever they're doing. Right. Cause it just takes so long to get off. Yeah. I mean, the two motion is the thing that, that does scare me a little bit. Um, with the I mean I just don't think he's like I think teams are going to sag pretty far off and I worry about how it translates and like what the real usage could be going for like if he starts to hit shots like do you feel good about this and you know off the dribble do you like where what is the next level if it starts to go off? I'm looking ahead a little bit too much um, but like I just have some small stuff with with how long it takes uh, and the two motionness of it all um, but like I mean I, I guess we're hoping for like a Tyreek style like development curve. Um, like I, again, like if you look at Tyreek's like the last four years in the league, he became a like a plus plus shooter for his size. Yeah, um, with roughly the same you know shot that he had uh, as he started to bounce around the league. It didn't like ever get super clean, but he he narrowed he he locked it in. Um, I don't think that's impossible here. I don't hate. Like I don't hate the the, the wrist broken. placement. No, I don't. I like the wrist placement. Yeah. Uh, I wish it there was a, a, a the the motion this right here was shaved out. Um, mm -hmm. but um, but I think it is really like also you know the reason why it comes Tyreek is like long arms built about the same you know rough uh rough dimensions. Um, but yeah, I think that they're like it would be nice if he was a hop guy. That's the other thing. Like it doesn't seem like it's in super rhythm. But I again, I can be accused of saying that for about most people when I don't like the rhythm. It's just like good luck. Um, yeah, that would help him a lot because he is powerful. Like it, it would actually do some good for him. I didn't need to think of, think about that, but yeah, hop would really help him. 
I think this is the end of the quarter. I think this is just some more pick and roll kind of handle improvement, dribble, and then also him getting to the line, which yeah, I do think it's a little strange how much his two point percentage and finishing around the rim dropped off from college to his rookie year, but his free throw rate stayed the exact same. Um, and he got to the line a little bit less than summer league, but in general, that was something that's been pretty promising. Um, so I think the way he kind of draws contact on this drive is good, but um, the handle here is something that, you know, he doesn't get to show a lot of, and it's still a little loose, um, but really like I the think, last step though. I re- that yeah, last step. Yeah, I, I love that really, last step. That was great. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I say Tyreek, then, you know, we kind of get that weird behind the back. Like, it, it is the same movement style. And yeah. I think, this also may, I had never put it together before, but this may also explain my uh, unnatural attachment to believing in Najee is that you know, <laughs> believing that if Tyreek had, had come into the league with more, like with more modern shooting development, you know, if he'd come in five years later, then like we're obviously talking about being an awesome player because even the, the version that had injuries and you know, just like the natural fall off of his athleticism um, was still extremely positive And we hope that he can get back soon. Um, you know, uh, comeback player of the year. Let's make it happen. Good pick. Yeah, so yeah, this is kind of a combination of that kind of transition and passing equity that we were talking about. And I will say his, if you go his assists for 36 numbers in college, they were about three and a half. His rookie year was four and a half. And then Summer League, that jumped up to 6.3, which, I mean, Summer League, small sample, but still making that jump from college to rookie year. I think that, um, I don't know. I just wonder how much, how impactful can his passing be if he's playing with either Ingram and Zion at all times? But something like this in transition, I think, is actually going to fit in pretty well, which is why I included it over some of his other half court passes. Hmm. I mean, I think this the skip pass you made earlier is something that can help him if he's playing a lot with Ingram, Ingram and Zion. Just picking out those type of reads because that's that's where you can really get a lot of value as a tertiary guy. Yep, creating advantage for guys who uh, don't like. I don't want to say don't need help, but will are best if they can just get a little bit of easier looks, um, right. uh, especially Ingram, um, you know, who who is prone to uh, trying to make tougher meals than he has to. Yeah, I I love how well he disguises this pass though on this drive. I mean, like you guys are right when you talk about a shot and if he shoots and everything, but. Najee brings so much extra fun little stuff to the table that like if he shoots, then yeah, he could be a, a starting level player. We talk about him spending all these minutes with, with Ingram and Zion on the floor, but I really do believe that he, he makes it up on the margins in so many fun little ways that I think that he will have a stable career. Now maybe that's for the Pelicans. Maybe that's for someone else, but I just, th- that little craft there. And on that last step on his other drive, I just thought really a, a Vince, a level of creativity that you don't see in, you know, most bench wings who are relegated to if he shoots. Yes, yeah. that's right. Keep me employed. Keep me employed. <laughs> we were, we refuse <laughs> these simple black and white narratives about if he shoots. Exactly. Exactly. And this clip isn't really much of a like to talk about, but I did, I just kind of wanted to include it here as like a talking point to see what you guys thought. Cause throughout summer league, especially in this game, when Najee was on the, off the court, um, they kind of, the Pelicans kind of got killed on the glass and he was averaging a uh, 12.9 rebounds for 36 minutes in summer league, which is an anomaly, but even his rookie year, that was seven and a half. And he's a really, really good rebounder for his size. And if they're going to go small and play a bunch of guards, I mean, Josh Hart's a really good rebounder too, but I wonder how much of like, if he's able to just like rebound a lot, is that going to help them go small as often as they want to compared to some of the other guards that without them getting just killed on the glass. Uh, I mean, it allows them to play fast while going small. Like any, yeah. ever, like the important part about going small is getting a. You don't have to have like a dominant rebounder as you go small. It's just that everybody has to provide, you know, ten percent more rebounding by a, uh, you know, according to, to like what would say his positional standards. So like this certainly helps. Like I don't necessarily know if you want to throw him at the four because I, again I like him guarding guards, but like you could certainly like if you go small with with him and Kyra. Like you can get up to some really fun speeds, yeah. Uh, exactly. Just like, him, like him, Kyra, and like Trey Murphy at the four. Uh, you know, if you want to throw Sato in there, because Sato makes smart decisions. Like now we're cooking <laughs> with a lineup that is trying to get two hundred points. Uh, That's uh, yeah, right. Exactly. It's just like you know what? Uh, let's let's crank this thing. Um, you know, uh, two hundred to one ninety nine. Who cares? Um, 
let's get the let's get the uh, the, the scoreboard operator a little bit of a workout. I love that, and that's going to cont- that's going to contend with, or that's going to con- that's going to depend on on Najee's ability to offer again just better than expected rebounding, and I think that he's shown that consistently, especially especially if he's guarding ones and, and you put Kyra on the lesser opportunity just to give him easier outlets. Yeah, uh, I, I fully support this idea. Yeah, I mean, the worry for me with them about going small wouldn't be rebounding. It would be, can we actually stop the other team from getting layups? Like, is, are we just going to let people waltz to the rim so the rebounding doesn't even matter, right? They, they're just, their interior defense isn't good. I don't think that's, that's a shock to anybody, but like, yeah, I, I, the rebounding wouldn't be the concern for me with the roster they have, and it's not a concern with Najee either. That probably makes sense, yeah. All right, let's. Uh... Yeah, and then this play is what we kind of talk about with just the full Najee Marshall experience. Just we were talking about how he does not, he is not afraid to get dropped and he is going to get all up in your grill. And something like this might not work against a James Harden or a Trey Young who Najee actually could be placed on if they were to play those teams. Um, but I mean, he kind of, I think, picks his spots of when he wants to do that 2K. Yeah defense and he picks his spots when he wants to be disciplined and right here end of the game i think he really took this on um and i don't know how many guys are hit as big as him that can stay with Trey man for this many counter moves um and force a turnover but it would have been malpractice for me to do a Najee game without including this clip so yeah i mean i i think that um like if they play atlanta and and like Dalno Banton is the, the point guard. Like, oh my God, they're going to put him on 94 feet. Like, we just talked about Banton uh, a couple of days ago. And like, Banton, you know, is one of those, you know, you know, six, eight guys who, you know, passes really well, but struggles to, you know, um, like handle pressure. And it's like, those are the guys that you throw Najee Marshall on and be like, hey, if you pick up two fouls here, like, we wouldn't be mad at it. Because, we, right. like, we would love to get those deflections, those steals. And like, you're going to really, even if they get into stuff, you're going to fluster it. Um, Skinnier guards. I think like the the two archetypes that you would want for for ball handlers are, um, um, are you know the 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 really light guys. Like I mean Sharif, we kind of saw what, how that went with, with with Deuce, but like that's the idea of like really light point guards. And then the the six and eight guys who usually glide by. It's like well if you're strong enough, you can just sit, like put your arm out and say no. Um, so I think both of those, especially on like second units or um, against teams that maybe play heliocentric and you want to disrupt that a little bit by going after the, you know, the, the catch and shoot style point guard. That's certainly a possibility with, with this kind of stuff. Um, I feel like this is pretty disciplined. Like he has this wild swipe right here. Um, but other than that, like his feet are disciplined, even if his arms aren't, which is really yeah. difficult to do. He's not, he's not stabbing with his feet, like, which is what a lot of uh, more aggressive defenders who do have those problems. Um, he's he's being, you know, his lower body is still pushing a direction. His lower body is still responding. He's just also swiping pretty wildly with his upper body. Yeah, pushing. exactly. Yep. All right. Uh, that is Najee Marshall. Um, I feel like we've talked about some lineup theory. We've talked about the if he shoots being uh, something nobody should ever say. Please don't ever bring it up. Um, we've talked about, um, you know, the, the college translation. Is there is there any last things that you guys feel like we haven't covered? Do you want to just like uh, give a hit on before we move on to uh, to all be inducted into the movie Mo- Moody Mafia? Naji is fun, and we he's appreciate so fun. fun on this yeah. stream. Yeah, he's uh, again. This is the fu- this is the funky wing stream. Um, it, unfortunately, we had to sacrifice Sharif because he didn't fit with the vibe. But um, <laughs> you know, you know, the vibe has to remain pure. It's, it's what it is. Um, all right, let's let me. I think this might be a touch out of it. Might oh nope, it's perfect. Okay, yes, this actually worked out. We are exactly where we needed to be with Moody. Okay, so Tommy, tell me about the five things that uh, you were paying attention to with Moses Moody. Yeah, so real quick at the top, I was uh, I was watching your Cam Thomas stream with uh, Lucas the other day, and you guys essentially described Cam as like a guy that you feel on every possession in summer league, like you know he's out there. Moody is almost the opposite in a way, where he's just like always kind of doing things on the margins that are making a difference. Like obviously the shot making pops sometimes and some of the random pick and roll stuff, but he's especially in a summer league setting, a lot of the stuff he's doing isn't going to get picked up. Um, and I, I think just being a Warriors fan, we kind of felt that within the fan base where it's like, oh, is this guy even good at basketball? It's like, no, he's really good. He's really good at basketball. You just got to like pay closer attention, you know? Um, 
but yeah, so areas of attention. Uh, obviously, I mean, my biggest concern with him coming out of college was just, is he strong enough for the NBA game? I don't think it's something that's going to be a limiting factor, um, like long term, but I think early on it might be like, I don't know if he can play more than 15 minutes a game his first year in the league, just because he's going to get so tired because he doesn't have the requisite like strength to withstand 82 games more than 15 minutes a game. And I could be wrong, but that was just the feeling I got watching summer league. And, and we'll go over that a little bit in these clips, but um, yeah, that it just, there, there is a ways to go. I don't think it's impossible to improve. Like you alluded, alluded to with uh, Jaden, it is stuff that the NBA is typically good at improving at. So it, it's not a lost cause at all, but it is something that is definitely um, a big area of, of concern early on. Um, and then I, I was kind of surprised watching this game and others in bits and pieces, um, how much kind of his effort or not effort, his attention to detail kind of wax and waned. And I, what I did, I think is I took more of kind of the micro view defensively with him. Um, and offensively it was more of the macro. And I, I think I took more of the micro angle defensively because that's going to be his way to finding time early for a team who might need some help on the wing, especially early in the season with clay being out. Um, so I was just surprised by how many times he kind of fell behind a play or like was a half step late on a rotation. Cause that was stuff that he, you know, ostensibly is really good at, but it could just be fifth game of summer league. He's tired, or it could be something that's once again, an, a strength issue where he, he just isn't strong enough to give that type of effort for 25, 30 minutes a game. Now, um, overcoming foot speed, just in terms of Kenny actually is the length going to be enough to combat, um, how slow he can look at times. I don't, I don't think he's, he's as slow as a lot of people have said he is, but he is definitely on the slower side for a 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, wing. Um, but I think overall my takeaway was that he will be able to, to overcome those things, and we'll get into that more. Um, obviously, playing off gravity, that's something that's, that's more team-specific. Um, playing off gravity or playing kind of in the vacuum that Steph's gravity creates, he, he's going to be really good in those situations. Um, he, he just, he's smart. He moves to the right places. He makes... It's not in this film, but he made a 45 degree angle cut from the wing on a baseline drive that like nobody on the roster would have made last year. Um, and those are the areas where he's really going to add like pockets of value playing with the starters if he gets that opportunity. And then the creation upside stuff. I don't have a ton of concerns in him being able to get to the mid range or kind of paint touches in general because he's every time you look up during summer league, he's like in the paint again somehow, even though he really isn't that strong. It's more is he going to be able to finish at the rim sufficiently to actually leverage that into other opportunities? Because if he's a guy who can't finish at the rim, a lot of the creation fades away because you don't need to worry about him getting all, all the way there. He's going to settle for floaters and weird in between shots that aren't really drawing that extra level of help defense. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm going to come away like seeming a little bit critical of him. I think after all these clips, but super fun player and I'm excited to get into this. Yeah, um, I think that, so I have, uh, uh, the first time I saw Moody was before, between his sophomore and junior years of high school, um, and he's one of the few players I've ever seen, um, I think in the first game I saw him, he hit four threes, and uh, he, like, fell to the ground on two of them, and they were open catch and shoots. Like, yeah. That was that was how bad his balance was as, like, a sophomore yep. in high school. So, yep. I, it, it might be hard to believe, but this is a night and day, and the core strength is a night and then balance especially, is a night and day improvement from where it was three years ago. So there's mm -hmm. at least a, a proof of concept that he can get better at it. Um, but also, like, it's been three years of, of Montverde in an SEC weight room and we're here. So mm -hmm. you can kind of read that one of two ways of like, you know, hey, we're on an upward trajectory, or like, you know, the best uh, high school and uh, uh, football weight rooms in, in the world have gotten you to a point where, like, you're still really struggling with this stuff. Um, yeah. The only the only thing I'd say is he was only 18. You know, I'm, yeah. we obviously know that he was only 18 his first year in the SEC, which is crazy young for any college player. And that's why I've been like I've been trying not to harp on it too much early on because he is still really, really young. Mm -hmm. But if it's still an issue two to three years from now, then, yeah, we're going to have some different discussions. Yeah. Um, the and and the final thing that I will say is like I'm not I'm not worried about him schematically defensively. I think that like the point of attack stuff is really uh, uh, 
it is a persistent concern going back to like when like BJ gave him trouble when when they yeah. played his junior year of high school. Like he's just never been a guy who you like can throw and do Najee Marshall stuff where he gets under people. That's not his. He's the uh, yeah, he is a guy who's much more of like a mirror from a distance and, and running the scheme. I don't think I have real worries about it, but he is a guy who very much like wants to have a scheme. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm not using this as a cover for just the guys that I really like, but like he comes from the same school that Cade does where it's like do the perfect thing every single time and summer league is so much not that um sure. and so i think that he's probably going to look better once like he's repped out every single rotation possible um versus yeah. a guy who's just like oh let me fly out here and, and use all my tools he's just not yeah. like he's more of a technician and this is not a technician in this environment no and the poa stuff is more just he can't get in a stance for long periods of time right now yeah. You know, like he'll, he'll just stand straight up because he, li he literally doesn't have the leg or, or the core strength to sit for a long time. But yeah, let, let's run these a little bit. So we get like a little bit of a pistol, pistol action here. He, he does such a nice job of coming off pick and rolls and playing with pace. Um, and then the floater game is like kind of already developed, but that also points to a little bit of um, the issues with him not wanting to go all the way to the rim. Um, mm -hmm. And as we go back to, if you rewinded just a couple steps there to right before yeah. the back cut. Yeah, we're getting all these twice, by the way, just so you know. Um, so oh, okay. Yeah, then let it, just let it go. Just yeah. let it go then. So the first, time is, the first time is regular speed, and the second time is, is way slowed down. So it yep. um, gives you space to talk about you know, the full idea, and then we can stop it when you get to anything that, that really jumps out to you. Yeah, and, and there, there's just to me, there's a lot of like kind of weird like Kyle Anderson vibes, but with, a, with high volume three here. Like that's what it looks like to me a lot of the time. Um, he comes off the pick and roll there. He gets tight on the big. He does his little in and out. And then he just sees the drop cover. He's like, yeah, I have a floater in my game, even though, you know, I'm only 19 and I really haven't worked on it that much. Like, that's not a shot I've gone to a lot. He did it a little bit at Arkansas. Um, but he has that in his game already. And here, this is just like, once again, picking on the micro. If I'm him, I'm a step closer to the key here so that back cut doesn't happen. And against a good team, that's a layup, right? Yeah. If you can get a step closer there and just be there at first, that back cut doesn't even happen. And then he can fill up and take away who's ever on the wing there. Um, uh -huh. But Against a good team, that's a layup. Yeah, he's also, he wasn't a rover in the Montverde system or, mm -hmm. or at Arkansas. He was yeah. the technical guy that allowed other people to be rovers. So like, Cade was a rover, Scotty was a rover, and Dariq was a rover. Mm -hmm. And he was simply the guy enforcing scheme. So, like, that's never 100% him. I mean, obviously, like, short area quickness is, is a thing you need to, to rove. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think that, like, him, like, shutting down a side of, you know, a, a side of the floor, being able to can corral a lift and a cut at the right. same time is probably right. a little beyond where he's going to be for the first couple of years, but Definitely. like a hundred percent, but I think he can get there. Yeah. I mean, with the, um, with the, like the plus eight wingspan, it, it, it covers a lot. Exactly. And here is just another one of those little things defensively. He does a nice job of kind of showing, even though JRE doesn't look at him um, and kind of stepping towards that drive, but get to the nail, dude, like at least get more than a half hearted left hand in here. Cause if yeah. you do, you probably stop that drive and it's not a layup. Um, and those are just, once again, those are those little areas where if he can do that stuff year one, he's going to find a lot of minutes because offensively he's so scalable and he can fit next to anyone and it's going to look good. Mm -hmm. Um, here we have some pick and roll defense, a little bit of screen nav gets hit kind of hard by that screen. Um, and then it just ends up in the open and an open shot on the other side. doesn't really matter, yeah. but I mean, scheme wise here, it looks like they're icing it. Um, not not this one, the, the actual pick and roll on the front side yeah. um, of the action. I'll give you the... Oh, yeah, yeah. perfect. It I'm looks like they're in. icing this pretty yeah. early. Like, get up into that ball handler, you know? Get, yeah. Really make him feel you, and then as he comes off of it, get that trail hand up so you can get it a flex. Like, just those little things where if he starts to do those consistently, he, I don't think he's ever going to be an all-NBA defensive guy just because of the foot speed is kind of limiting in those areas. but. Those are little air, like right here, as he comes through you, you hear ice, like get up into that the ball handler's left-hand side, force him there, and then as he goes to throw that pass, that trail hand should already be up trying to get a deflection. Your arms are so long, either they're not going to throw it or you're going to get the deflection and you're going the other way. Yeah, I mean, I think that he's just a little bit more conservative than like you would want sure. in, in somebody to pick up at like what's essentially uh, uh, 35 feet. And the like, yeah. well, we've harped on the on the foot speed, and it's like, well, if this ice doesn't like, if this ice big does not execute, like that's a walk in yeah. snake layup. And yeah. so, like, I think that he's just trying to do enough to ensure the coverage. 
Like, obviously getting hit by that is not, like, isn't part of the scheme. But he's trying to walk it down. And then you can kind of just see that, like, he's simply just trying to not get lit on fire. Which is, like, yep. that's, I mean, for a rookie, that's a, a meaningful something. It's just that you you need him to, that's the, the bottom of his value. It's not yeah. getting lit on fire. You need to add, you know, block percentage, deal percentage, the ability to, to disrupt beyond exactly. the individual stuff. Yeah, how, that, that or, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, how easy do you all think that is to develop out of someone who's wired the way that Moody appears to be wired? I mean, uh, are we talking about like in a normal circumstance or in a circumstance where I have Draymond? Because like uh, the, cir- the circumstance he's in, might as well just talk about yeah, the I mean, circumstance like, he's like, in. I mean, like I, I trust Moody extremely deep because like, I mean, I've seen probably a hundred plus Moody, Moses Moody games at this point. Mm-hmm. Um and so, like, I understand that he will internalize scheme really well. And it's just a matter of, like, this is what this team needs. I know that he, um, you know, is uh, wired to be a, like, burn-it-all-down psychopath in terms of winning. And if, that, if like, again, the exact way that Draymond is, the, like, exacting, this is what this rotation has to be, like, you, is not, is a language that Moody is more than fluent in. And is a thing that he will take to extremely well. He's like, oh, okay, at least we're clear here. I have no problems with this. Like, it's not going to be a, like, an issue like it seems like Wiseman has trouble being discoursed at on defense. Like he doesn't like like he, he has issues with tone, it seems. Or it's just like, no, no, that's just where you have to be there and I'm in this moment. So we're we're obviously like having a heightened conversation. But like when you lift, you have to be here, Rook. Like that's gonna be a thing that Mo's just like, okay. And so I think that it's going to be easier to get him into those spots. It's also like this is precisely what they need and having a a, a not just the cover of Draymond, but the cover of of like Wiseman allows for him to be more aggressive and get like cooked a little bit like be singed a little bit more not cooked but like risk being singed more because there's more cover on the backside um because as this team gets fully assembled that's just the sort of role that they need because they don't really have a guy who's good at that and also does more uh of the like technical side yeah and i think there's two things there really draymond will get him to these spots more often times than not he'll be telling him exactly where he needs to be um and to your point about his mentality the first article that I, it either came out in the San Francisco Chronicle or the Mercury Bay News, I can't remember which one. The first article they wrote about him was that from the time he was like a junior in high school, he was focusing on, I'm gonna do the role player things to be in the NBA, which is an insane thing for a five-star prospect to think, but that's how he's re- that's how he's built. Like he wants to just do all the correct basketball things and it's gonna help him so much, especially early on. Yeah, and like, again, like, Ma, I, I don't know how much you guys know about Ma Bird, but like 30 page scouting reports were normal on every high school. Like he was a, yeah. he was a central part of the best high school team of my lifetime. Yeah. And yeah. like they beat state title teams by 50 on a regular basis. Just by like, we know your plays, we execute them better. Our defensive schemes are exacting. Everybody has to be exactly where they are. And so like that style of communication is the exact style that like you see with Draymond, you see with Kerr, um, you know, you see with Ron Adams. So like, this is going to be a, a pretty hand and glove cultural fit for defensive expectations. I, so I think that because of those factors, like to, to, to sort of connect this back to the question, because of those underlying factors, I think it will be easier to get him to turn that, uh, you know, the execute scheme versus execute, you know, individual matchup filter a little bit higher because they're going to be like, hey, um, the role player thing we need out of you is to be slightly more disruptive. And that's going to resonate. Yep, absolutely. Um, so on this one, there, there's a couple fun things here, I think. He does a really nice job of crashing the old glass, and he did it at Arkansas, too. He's not getting a lot of them yet, because once again, he's just so weak physically. But I think eventually this is a rebound he wins, or he roots Edwards underneath there as the shot's in the air. He roots him under the rim, and he just kind of grabs it and sticks it back in. Um, Great hustle here for a rookie. Most rookies don't make this play, chasing the big towards the rim run. Um, And then I don't know if he needs to leap here to help the big contest that shot. Um, And by doing that, he takes himself out out of position for the rebound. And they end up with two points. And this is just, once again, more micro level stuff where it, it, I think it'll get worked out. But like, he doesn't need to go for that block there, especially if that's Draymond at the rim. Like, just stay there and be ready for the rebound. You know, yeah. you're going to have guys that can actually contest that shot at the rim. Just block out the big and go get the rebound. Yeah. Oh, also, he played for Eric Musselman. I, I feel like that <laughs> deserves a lot of mentions. Um, that, is, <laughs> yeah. that is a guy who uh, loves a defensive discourse. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, See, like this, he's not, he, he is not wired to like over help. Like if anything, yeah, he at times under helps, uh, yeah. um, which like I think is 
like, it seems studious. Like he's seeing the play. He's just choosing yeah, to be a little bit there. closer. Like, yeah, just, get, like, yeah, just take one more step. He sees and, where he's he supposed to be. Length. Yeah. He has enough length. And what I did notice, I don't have any clips here. He does a really nice job of like closing short to guys on the perimeter, but understanding how long he is. So he can still get a hand up on the shot and then take their drive away, even though he is slower. Yeah. Um, and we'll go over this as we run through it slower here. Um, just, just like a really fun, like grab and go flash. Um, we, we've been over kind of the early part of this year, just get a step closer to the key and you can probably stop this layup attempt from maybe even happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you can still recover out to the perimeter. Like you have enough to do it. And these are the things, the type of aggressiveness that I think Golden State can really coach into him. Um, and then we just talked about him not getting a contested rebound on the other side. He gets one here. Like he goes up against a big and gets a contested rebound. And then he's just like, okay, I'm gonna basically going to go get a bucket. Um, the handles are like a little bit loose here. He kind of loses it on the in and out. Yeah, I'd he, say more than a little. Yeah, yeah. Like he, like he loses it there, but he still gets the defender off balance. And that's really easy getting into a 22-foot step back for a guy who just turned 19. Like that's really smooth. The, the tougher part is going to be creating that, that separation on the front end. It's not going to be getting into his shots. It's going to be, can he create the initial separation to get to those step backs? Um, and that's where I have Unlike a lot of other skinny guys, he's really comfortable going backwards. Or not unlike, like in a lot of other skinny guys, like we saw this when we talked about BJ. Like BJ, very comfortable moving backwards and shooting. Mm -hmm. The issue for both of them is moving forwards and shooting. Yep. So like yep. he would struggle to like go full speed and stutter and pull, but he can, mm -hmm. he's much more comfortable with like doing it, you know, across, uh, hang into a cross and then stepping back out of it. Um, like range isn't super deep, but like he certainly doesn't mm -hmm. struggle to to shoot from NBA range. It's not um, super deep yet, but yeah. I think it's a high release. It is a, yeah, it is. It is. But it, it just, it, once again, it really is strength stuff. That's what almost everything comes back to with him. Yeah. Um, you're just him playing within the system. Um, we'll break it down as we go a little bit slower here and just a nice, like good shot prep. That's what they're going to need him to do. That's what they got to coach into him. year one. Like if you have even a semi contested look, let it fly. And that's where I hope Atkin Atkinson's influence can help because Kerr has been a guy who just doesn't want like anybody besides Stephen Clay taking remotely contested shots or, or Katie when he's there, obviously it's like, no dude, you have to let this shot fly. Um, and, and that would be my biggest point of emphasis with him his rookie year. If you have any space on the perimeter, you're a good enough shooter, let it fly. You know, we don't want you shooting crazy contested ones, but any semi contest, it's gotta go up because then teams have to play a step closer to you. You're creating space for all the guys who are the superstars. So how long will his leash be if he goes through a slump in December or January. That's that's always the question. I don't know. I don't I know. Mean, I can't. I can't answer the question. Is is this the time to bring up his extremely strange superpower? Um, he is the best four point play drawer I've ever like I've seen in my <laughs> lifetime. Like straight off up, the catch. off like any closeout, he will like he has a a he will like he will sort of scissor kick, but he like just leans a little bit backwards and kicks his front foot forward. And I think it's just from years of falling over when he would just take care of shoots. He sell like again. The man is going to be a fantastic wrestler when he's done um, being an NBA player because he sells <laughs> all these closeouts, and you believe every time it's a foul. And then you watch like the alternate angle. You're like, not even close. But every time refs blow the whistle because it, it looks like a foul. And um, there are times where he like, I, you can tell he. he or, I don't know. I think that he knows he's missing a shot, and he goes into Plan B, which is to get three free throws. And so many times in the SEC, people would close that hard on him when he's already hit two threes. And then he would walk to the free, free throw line for three free throws. So I think that he does have, for a guy who doesn't necessarily get fouled a ton and doesn't have a ton of pathways to free throw rate, he has a very unique, especially for a guy with like uh, a closer to clay handle than Jordan Poole handle. Yep. Um, he has a pathway to getting fouled a ton. And that's a mixture of the hard closeouts he's going to get. Because if you give him hard closeouts, I guarantee you there will be a game this year where he gets three free shot fouls. Mm -hmm. There will be at least one. And so you're going to just get like the cutaways to some, you know, uh, like younger. It's going to be a younger guy who does it just getting screamed at being like, how was I supposed to know he had this? Like, how was I supposed to know that if you got if you came into his landing area, he, uh, you know, he turned into uh, Roddy Rod Pepper. Like, it, it's funny because Poole does the same thing. Poole, Poole doesn't sell thing. it, though. Like, no, he doesn't sell it as well, but he yeah. he tries to do the same thing. Yeah. Um, I've been harping on his defense a lot, obviously, but like that's just a really big time play from a kid in summer league. Like there's. I don't know if it's a block or a charge. Like that's that's a ref thing where it might get called, it might not. He reads the play well. He kind of gets the spot. It might be a block, 
But selling out like that in summer league, you just don't get guys that do that a lot, especially lottery picks. Like the guy was picked 14th overall. He's not a guy trying to make the back end of a roster. He's taking a charge at 19 years old as a lottery pick. That you just don't get that often. Uh, this is my favorite play of him from this entire yeah. thing. Um, yeah, it's an because awesome play. It, okay, it's not the fact that the play happens; it's where it starts from. So we've mm-hmm. talked about him. I don't know if it's un- being uncomfortable two nining. I mean, obviously, this is his first time with a new set of rules. Um, yeah. It's something to be especially considerate of of guys who are mostly like corner defenders because, like, mm-hmm. they're the ones more than bigs who have to deal with it. Because, like, every big has kind of been warned about this moment their entire life. Where it's like they'll yep. eventually have to two nine, and you know they've been trained for it. But like wing defenders have to be much more cognizant of of two nine because it's just not a thing that like when you're six six that gets brought into your skill development or you know training until you get to pre draft. So I have some ideas about like why he's so far over, but he goes from here to get a real verticality with him. Like yeah, and he might have moved a little bit forward, but I mean, and he even recognizes a little bit late. If you watch it in slow mo, like when the when the pass comes out, he's not even moving yet. So it's like long strides, pretty impressive ground, ground coverage, and then like a big man yep, type of verticality. He's yep. not even moving yet. Yep. He's going to say two lar- basically three steps, and he goes pretty straight up and down. Yep. Most rookies don't know how to do that, even if they're a seven-footer. James Wiseman can't do that yet, but Moody's already doing it. Yep, and again, this comes from defensive pedigree and, and the, like, again, he, he, you can tell he plays with a set of expectations about scheme. And like, again, these are the things that are not particularly like flattered upon in summer league. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know how many other uh, uh, media outlets are being like, you guys have to, we have to watch this play or this six foot, okay, we'll be honest, six foot, five, like four and a half mm-hmm. wing goes vertical and stonewalls a, a big on a 45 cut in which he has no business getting over. Like, mm-hmm. That's just not something that makes the most summer league highlight reels. But to no. me, this is like, this is the thing that should make Steve Kerr feel good at night about mm-hmm. the, the draft that he had. Or it's like, yeah, no, I have a guy who I know will be able to understand an NBA scheme. Uh, it takes probably, I would say, the hardest specific thing that that a wing has to do, which is to get over and, and throw their body in front of like what's most likely going to be a dunk attempt. And as a rookie, he's getting a a good verticality okay. attempt to fight, despite the fact that like the man doesn't really have a core yet, and yep. it, it's going to be a couple years away. This is just incredibly encouraging, like winning basketball, or you know, like necessary to win basketball. Um, from a guy who, like, that was always his calling card, and it's nice to see him even in this setting. And he's pretty explosive off two feet, even though he isn't off one feet. Yeah. Or one foot. So and this is this is just a super fun sequence. I'm just going to let it run, and then we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. Just great pass, and then gets back in transition here, takes away that kind of the backside read. Once again, too conservative. Like, get back in the play, maybe get the rebound there. Mm-hmm. Um, but finds a spot, trails into a three. Like, that's just feel stuff, like understanding where the play's going, and then just stepping in and burying a three. Um, this second, the, like, this kind of second side, secondary creation stuff, I think he's going to be do, be able to do some of this early, especially against second units. Like, once again, really nice pace off the pick and roll. I would like um, him to shoot this, just, just a, an aside. Sure, I, sure. I, it may not be this year. He may not mm-hmm. be wired for it yet. Mm-hmm. But, like, I think that if this were college... Like it, maybe it's the NBA. Like obviously those couple of these, in college he would most likely have pulled this, especially yeah. like and tried to sell for that that the guy getting knowing he's going to get try to fight over the screen. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to just see like I'm going to watch all the cutups where they watch you know they run this uh, this sort of like a uh, chop stuff with him. Yep. Um, because I know he's going to bait some uh, uh poor wing defender into that that three point play. Slow yep. pace, you're right. What's the lob? Nice spot? Stop. Yep, a solid spot. Not great. Not bad. Mm-hmm. But he he does a really nice job of manipulating the big and pulling him a step farther so he can actually throw that lob. Yeah. Um, and then just kind of really nice backside coverage here. He sees it super early and he gets there. But once again, his balance is terrible. He's falling back at the end of the play. Get in there and rebound. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is just, I think this is just really good recognition here. This is stuff he's going to have all the time playing with Draymond when he's pushing. Trail the play, find a spot. You're going to be wide open. You knock shots, or if you knock down shots like this at a nice rate, you're gonna play a lot your rookie year. You just are like that. That that's what really popped to me. The offense is so scalable already. Like he can play with almost any type of guy. You obviously don't want to be in a primary yet, not even close to that. But he's gonna be able to fit in so many lineup combinations because he can shoot and he understands where to be. So the secret to the, the four point play thing is he had this leg like kicks out. It's not like yeah. it's not. It's they just both kind of like drift out 
almost mm-hmm. like a jumping jack. It's 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 he lands more solidly than he used to. I used to have more like a lot of concern about his knees um, in mm-hmm. that way. But like that right knee comes in a lot on yeah. when he loads up. Yeah, there's there is quite a bit of valgus collapse, which again like glutes, the stretching, that's all going to be important. Um, yep. You know, goes to core strength, goes to a lot of the the, the, the lower body explosiveness uh, issues. Yep. But like this is the same thing. It's just at that moment, if this guy was a little bit closer. He just simply mm-hmm. like scissors out a touch more, and then he get he'd get a four point five. That's that is the it looks roughly the same. And once once you start noticing that he tweaks his landings depending on how close the guy is, you will never stop. It, the second he shoots, I don't watch it. Like I'll, I'll I'll glance at his release and then I just go to the feet to be like, are we getting it? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, another example here where they're going to coach this into him, I think, mm-hmm. be a step higher. That's a, that's a wide open three because you're not there. You yeah. know, it doesn't go in, but if you're a step higher there, you can, you're long enough to kind of throw your left hand at the guy and chase back to the corner or take him and somebody else can X out for you. Um, yeah. But, he, he, he just defends this like he's Brian Cardinal. Like, yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's the big concern here is just being like somebody pulling him aside and be like, hi, you're really athletic. Like, yeah. Functionally, you're very athletic. Like you can, you mm-hmm. can, you can function at a higher level than other people. You mm-hmm. need to start gambling with that. Um, yep. And getting that mentality and still is going to be important. Because, like, again, even what is this stuff? Like, I know his balance is bad, but you can still like three step this, where you sprint, yeah. sprint, and then hockey step out. Um, and it, I think it's, it's an old man. It's an old man uh, stunt. It's speed of the game stuff too. Where like he's not recognizing that the ball is already going the other way. Like it's just the NBA game just moves a little bit faster. And he needs to be a step higher there as that pass is happening. Like before it even leaves Maladon's hands, he's got to be a step higher. Um, yeah, we're, we're good. We can move on from that one. Uh, we get a Kuminga, like little Kobe impression there, swings out to Moody. Um, this is maybe an area where he can eventually get a shot because he's strong enough he can step back into something. And then just a really, really nice like connecting pass. Like he picks this out pretty early. You'll see it in the slow-mo. Um, so once again, it comes over to him. I think eventually he'll have kind of the strength to maybe just rise up into a two dribble pull up here if they want him to be that guy, like three, four, five years down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you pause it right as he kind of like picks up the dribble and starts to pivot, like Kaminga's cutting and he already sees it. He's kind of yeah. behind the big man defender there. He's already picking it out and finding it. And these are just more little ways that they didn't have a lot of guys who could do this last year. Like Golden State just didn't have a lot of guys who could see that type of read and connect the plays. So, you know, Steph ends up with a wide open corner three um, or eventually Clay does or whoever. But that, that's just, it's just really impressive play for a 19 year old. Uh, what do we have here? Okay. I, I just thought he drifted a little bit here. Yep. Like he, he fakes out Edwards pretty nicely at, at the start of the move here. Just with a tiny jab step. And once again, he, he just kind of keeps getting to the paint somehow, even though he's not that fast. Yeah, um, again, he plays like an old man, but he keeps getting good spots. Exactly. And, and eventually you just got to chalk it up to him knowing how to play, but like veer back into him there, you know, take away his angle and then maybe pull the big back out. So you give your role man more of more space to roll, but he just dribbles right into a two dribble pull up. He predetermines it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then having coming in the corner, like doesn't help. Nobody. Yeah. Isn't, I think that if he, if, if he simply slows here, this is a mm-hmm. coming dunk. Because if he slows, yeah. like this big is stepping towards him. There is a mm-hmm. bounce pass in that little window. If he slows mm-hmm. down, that Kaminga will recognize. Like this, and is he it. does find those a lot. Yeah, he does. But th- that requires faith in your dribble. It requires like he's not a guy who likes being touched on, de- on as a ball handler. Um, mm-hmm. He's fine with like I think contact generally. But like if if people start to climb into his handle, you can tell he gets a little bit jittery. Um, yeah. So I think that he feels that in closing, and he's like, "Well, time to get a shot up or make a quick decision." Um, mm-hmm. I. He's definitely a guy that I would like just in practice have him like dribble next to three or four like GAs or you know uh, you know the the low level staff guys where they're just like hey you have to stay within this area and keep your dribble mm-hmm. alive and then be like hey try to fuck him up for like five minutes um, yeah beat him beat him up with a pad like yeah. whatever you got to do just get him comfortable dribbling with guys hitting him yep um, even if it's during like a meeting or you know going over that day's plan or you know in between mm-hmm. while well, somebody else is stretching and he's you know waiting. Just a couple of minutes a day of just getting comfortable with with being a little bit more congested, being like, hey, look, you're a role player, but that doesn't mean that you have to be a robot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's such an important delineation to when you're trying to develop a guy. It's so tough. It really is. Um, and then, okay, like that pick, last pick and roll is like kind of like not what you want, but then this is like a two-point game, I think, with a minute and a half left. And he's just like, yeah, I'm going to do a little in-and-out dribble here and throw up the funkiest hook you've ever seen. And I'm going to give our team a four point lead. 
so goofy. I mean, he's not explosive at all off of one foot. Now, there is obviously improvements that can happen there, but he just, he's more developed than even I would have expected. Even with a good Arkansas sample out of pick and roll, like he's better than I thought he would be in these situations early on. Um, and Dude, the, this the is a finishing, goofy foot hook. Look, he jumps off that yeah. right foot and shoots it with his right Crazy. hand. Crazy. And, and that's a guy who probably hasn't really even worked on that move that much. Uh, who um, would? Just, Whomst? No, <laughs> nobody. Nobody. Um, yeah, that's Moses Moody. Just really fun player. Really fun. I, like I said, I think overall, I don't know how much he's going to be able to play year one because game 57 in Detroit on the second night of a back-to-back and you're playing at 4.30 local time, you know, it's a 7, seven o'clock tip-off or 7.30 tip-off in Detroit, he's going to be exhausted, right? I, I don't know how realistic it is for him to play 82 games next year or even 75, 70, but overall, I, I came away almost more optimistic because of what he showed offensively. Um, it's There's a lot there to eventually be a really, really plus player on both sides. All right. Um Let's let's get some quick uh, some quick movie thoughts and and we can head on out of here. I mean, I I obviously have a small victory lap to run. I don't try to do this too often, but I do need to just like get a quick just like can I cut a quick promo at the end and you know uh, and then you know. But uh, I would love to hear everybody else's thoughts. Um, I was glad you had the play with the connector pass near the end because you had if you didn't have it, I was going to ask about that because I just I was I was so kind of pumped and curious when Golden State took him once. I didn't think he was going to drop that far, but I don't. But then also just like with Steph and Clay running around like Mad Men with Draymond, you know, coming off the roll doing his thing. I was curious if Moody's connecting passing was at the level to where, if that was going to be an avenue to him getting extra play time next year. Because like you said, they don't have a ton of players that do that. And I wasn't sure how much he's shown that or how much you guys think if, if that's like a years away or if he could do that next year. Um. I don't think it's years away in this sense. If he's like a guy receiving it with a lot of space, he's going to pick out the next correct pass. I think most of the time, actually. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's funny. You mentioned him playing with kind of the core three guys. I think eventually he has enough size. He can like rebound well enough to play with those lineups. I don't, I don't think he'll be ever not soon. He won't be able to guard bigs, but I think he's going to rebound eventually well enough to be like the fourth guy in that type of lineup. If they're still all together, who knows right. what's going to happen. Um, but he's going to rebound well enough eventually. So it, it is super intriguing. Just it would be really fun to see him out there with those three guys. I think it could look good in moments. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that that's certainly a possibility. Uh, Chuck, you have any any uh, burning Moses Moody thoughts? <laughs> Not as burning as y'all do, man. I want to hear this promo, but I, I really liked... Um, I just really like his decision making on offense. I know on that um, one where he pulled that two dribble pull up a little quickly, that wasn't ideal. But even, you know, you said that you think he gets uncomfortable when someone is, you know, on his hip in his handle. I actually was relatively encouraged, especially again, all the usual qualifiers about his athleticism, about his ability to, you know, stay relatively composed in the lane in Arkansas. You know, he did have a pretty healthy free throw rate that wasn't just you know, those patented four pointers. And I think a lot of that had to do with him sort of understanding that he's not going to blow by tons of guys and using his length in the lane. Uh, there wasn't really an example of it in the film we watched, but using his length in the lane intelligently and knowing um, when to get some shots off. And on that clip where he gave the lob, where it was like, this lob is okay, you know, not great. I thought that that was a really good process by him because that was another one where he hadn't gained a lot of separation on his mm -hmm. defender, but to not force a shot there and to have the patience to try to time and place that lob, I think speaks to his brain, you know, particularly on offense. I still think that the real movement for him is what y'all were talking about where I asked, you know, how do you develop out of the sort of, um, you know, sound role player defensive wiring that he has into being a bit more aggressive and we saw that in a couple plays but on offense i i'm very encouraged and i really am looking forward to see how he gets his minutes in his rookie year yeah um so i think that uh the the thing that i would say is that like he this is probably the most laborious i've ever seen him like move 
uh, overall. And it's also the most I've ever like watched him think on defense. Like, he's very much a guy who like is instinctive, but I, you know, from seeing him in multiple contexts, I can say that instinctiveness comes from like a, a certainty in the scheme, like knowing exactly where he's supposed to be. And then he gambles versus vice versa, which we see with a lot of younger guys where it's like they know that they can do certain things and then they learn where they're supposed to be on defense and, and where the assignments are. So I think that we're going to see a natural level of comfort once he's told, like, on this possession, you're here in this action, you're here on, you know, if the guy is over a 40 percent shooter and they're on an inside pick and roll, like that's where his, uh, you know, like his comfort space is, is like getting really in the weeds and internalizing those those schemes, which is also why I think he's going to play more as a rookie is that, like, I think that the coaching staff is going to enjoy having a rookie that they can just like talk at and he just absorbs it. And, and really like wants to be in those uh, minutia. I, it's not that like, like Wiseman is still learning to like, is still coming from behind of his like games debt because of the years that, that, you know, he didn't have through, um, uh, you know, through the like last two and a half years of, of his, um, his prep and, and pre-draft uh, uh, experience. But like, he's still learning stuff where like Moody, it's actionable. If you tell him like, we are high on hedges. We are low on big shooters. Um, we are sending two on. Uh, we are sending two on the glass for every uh, uh, three above the key. We are sending four to the glass on corners, and we are you know breaking every time that somebody snakes a pick and roll. I think he would just like snap to that. And they haven't had a rookie that's really been like that in quite a while. And uh, that is a different. Um, development situation when you your vets are automatically comfortable with a guy and they know they can um you know interface with him on that level so i think that like in a lot of ways this was the hurdle where i was worried he was going to look really bad because of just like having no scheme and having to kind of like be hyper conservative knowing that there wasn't something that would generally make you look good um so with that sort of out of the way um i think that people grossly misunder represent like what uh what we determine to be the word potential um broadly we tend to mean like do cool stuff or be a star bet um i think moody is one of the clearest examples and and this has sort of been my claim since uh since i wrote uh, my piece on him between his at the end of his junior year to moving into a senior year is that if you have a player who can win you basketball games and when you play off basketball games that's a form of potential and doing all of the things that matter in playoff series, especially at positions of need, and especially whose game is moldable as needed from lineup to lineup. Like we see him run pick and roll, and there's a there is a scalability with that, where obviously like there are spots you don't want him to run pick and roll, but you can move that as you need to with a lineup, whether it's you know one pick and roll every three possessions or you know a pick and roll every other possession, depending on the lineup. Um, we see a player who has core stability issues, but is still capable of shooting off extreme movement. And that's a form of scalability because like, what are you supposed to do if you run like Steph, Steph, Clay, Moses, Moody, back screen, back screen, back screen. Like that is a, a possibility where like you can just put a ton of shooters on the floor. Um, he has defensive versatility in that he can add wins just without needing to be a point of attack defender. Like even if he never gets to be a, a, a more than just adequate point of attack defender, that is already a, a playoff, like his his skill alignment and, and the versatility that he has within scheme defense is already a theoretical playoff plus. Anything else is just the ceiling for the team going higher. And so while there are there were many other prospects in this draft that have uh, like higher individual ceilings, um, the ability to win basketball games is ultimately what your franchise is about. Um, and if you uh, are looking at the things that this particular Warriors team needs and being like, Hi, I would like to maximize uh, where we are currently and like what have been the issues with the wings that you've had in the, you know, the post KD years or the post KD post Igadala years, or like, you know, since Igadala, you know, um, mummified, I guess. Um, you would generally be describing a player that looks like Moses Moody. So when people say like, oh, you know, this, this solid role player, it's like, oh, that's a, that's a median outcome. Um, but then it gets very, the outcomes get very lofty very quickly. And it's not by projecting uh, an insane skill growth or, you know, a, a usage conditioner. It, it's just, does your team meet the qualifiers to make the little things that he does extremely well matter? And can you build environments to build some of the like things that are, are more uh, tendencies to be tweaked higher? And in that case, you can get a player who like maybe swings the playoff series. Maybe he's the player who gets you an extra win 
that it turns instead of a, a six game series to a five game series again for a team that um, drafted two teenagers having one that may be much closer to contributing now um, is extraordinarily important and I think that Warriors fans broadly have not have, have sort of returned to the idea of like stars sort of look a certain way and it's not about stars in your role it's about stars in the win column and like as corny as that does sound like tell look through the complaints that people have had about wings and i know this is a very specific rant because the warriors uh, are a team that i've watched both through myself and through the yelling that i get on the phone after every single loss uh, is that when there are specific vacancies those are pathways to enable the stars you already have so in that way i think that the development of moses moody instantly becomes one of the 10 most interesting developments in the nba because he doesn't necessarily have to get that much better all the things he does is just connecting it to what the warriors do specifically i i can't believe they got him i cannot believe they got him at 14 i was pretty fell past indiana i was like whoa they're gonna pick him because they did like him in the pre-draft process they just didn't like him enough at seven especially with coming still there um but like you said, I'm I'm acting like he was the first pick. I'm I'm just gonna go with that because that's what uh that's what I need to believe in my heart to know this team is going in the right direction. Um so yeah, any any final thoughts on on Moses Moody? I you know, I I hope the Warriors keep him with the way that y'all are laying it out. I just I hope they do. I I have my own macro concerns on the Warriors' priorities in that area and how much of this stated enthusiasm about him and Kuminga and Wiseman and following the development path and the contending path at the same time, how much of that is real, how realistic it is, them sort of trying to import a developmental culture in, you know, by whole cloth in an off season. But as far as what we were here to do tonight, um, I had a great time and that, that moody stuff was definitely a highlight watching you two cook on him. So Thank you very much. I learned a lot. I'm just thankful that you uh, you guys stuck it out and, and gave me this opportunity to to rant about uh, you know the values of connecting wings who do off ball defense. Um, you know, uh, real real basketball nerd hours. And, and thank you guys so much for. I mean, this is this is such a deep basketball nerd one. Like this is some hard. <laughs> this is some intense lore happening here. Um, you know, these are, these are this basically is like, basketball LARPing. Yeah, we are a hundred percent. These are, this is like reading all of the books in Skyrim, but for basketball, um, mm-hmm. let the people, okay, we're going to go around, hit your plugs, everything. Like, again, when I say plugs, I mean, plug everything that you've ever written at all the places people can find you, uh, cut the, cut the promo list of promos. You deserve it after one waiting out my insanely stupid technical difficulty and two, uh, giving a, just a, a great, uh, a great very nuanced, very, very, very granular stream that I feel like people are going to get a lot from. Okay, I, I, I guess I'll start. I'm um, at Brian Windhorse. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm at Chucking Darts. I host the Chucking Darts NBA podcast. Um, the only written piece I have, I think, is pinned to my Twitter, and it was my final board with some thoughts on the lottery uh if you follow me or if you follow my podcast you'll know that i'm very very high on trey murphy the third on usman garuba i'm a big fan of rocco percaccian but on my uh podcast i try to have people on who i can learn something from have a good conversation with uh pd was nice enough to come on a couple months ago had a very good episode on uh, you know, how three and D is largely a misnomer. I'm glad that we were able to represent that brand tonight by saying if he shoots is just, you know, a complete fallacy that should never be uttered again. Um, but breaking down different kinds of wings and wing theory, that's the kind of draft stuff I like to get into, you know, bigger picture philosophical stuff, because as far as X's and O's go, that's something I'm working on and something I was glad to push myself with tonight. But if you like that, if you also like some, you know, some of the more, uh, I guess, saccharine and digestible NBA talk about predictions, that's the other conceit of my podcast. So would be happy for any listeners to, you know, check it out. And if you're interested in guesting on it, just give me a DM and we'll figure something out. So thank you all very much. Yeah, I can go next. Um... Pretty much the only thing that I uh, have to plug is I, at Twitter, I'm at, at Bendog28, where I can do straight, I'll just post straight thoughts about prospects or teams or NBA plays. 
Um, and then the only other thing that I have that's been published um, was in the DePaul Journal of Sports Law, which once again just analyzes how um, the NBA's next collective bargaining agreement could be impacted by COVID-19 and or the player strike in the bubble. So if you're in for a long read and interested in kind of the history of the CBA, feel free to check that out at DePaul uh, Journal of Sports Law. Yeah, and once again, uh, you guys can find me on t Twitter at uh, tgun21 if you want to see me argue with Warriors fans all day, um, argue about how Joe Lacob is an idiot and uh, the timeline doesn't make any sense. Feel free to follow me. Um, no, but seriously, PD, thank you for having us on, man. This was so much fun. Uh, this is the type of stuff that I don't get to do enough anymore now that I'm not involved with basketball on the daily or not coaching or anything since I'm working a normal person job. Um, this was so much fun, man. Thanks for having us on. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see the full product come together on YouTube. Yeah, um, uh, I'm I'm PD. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Above the Break Three. Um, you can find each one of these, including the, the subsequent ones, uh, on YouTube or Twitch, um, uh, along with you know the long form breakdowns that I, or the long form individual prospects that I've done. Uh, you know, I think I did 80 percent of the lottery, and uh, including the marathon stream, like. 37 guys on, on YouTube. Um, if you are more of a written person, uh, I write about uh, player development theory, uh, about, you know, re rethinking, reconsidering, you know, how we, how shooting is developed, how feel is developed, and, and trying to present cases for, uh, you know, a, a more contextual look at prospects. Um, that's on Patreon. The work is always free, but if you can toss me a couple bucks, it, it's much appreciated to help pay for, you know, the you know the, the streaming setup and and the stats and video packages um uh, uh all that has been really awesome i just want to thank, say thank you to everybody uh for you know supporting me for for writing up i can't believe that there are people who watch these live for two and a half hours as, as i get to ramble about the utility of, of ram screens or you know this is it's literally the the most wonderful thing and, and i'm so glad that you guys were here to uh, to allow me to do it because I certainly wouldn't have done it uh, without you three really guiding the conversation and, and keeping me off uh, extremely long ramblings about, you know, why uh, Anthony Randolph uh, is the greatest what if in, in NBA history, because that eventually would have happened if I was given two and a half hours by myself. So I just want to say thank you guys. I appreciate it so much. Um, uh, support the people, uh, support everybody who comes on here. You know, the only way that we can help basketball is, is by doing stuff like this, by pushing conversations forward, uh, you know, uh, just having places where you can talk stuff like this out and uh, and show your work and you know less wild hot takes and all caps on Twitter. Um, that not that, that stuff doesn't have a place, but if that's the majority of our basketball discourse, then we deserve what we get coming afterwards. So that's the mission of this, and uh, I'm happy to that everybody in here help help push that forward. All right, have a wonderful night, everybody. I will talk to you guys later. Thank you guys again. <laughs>